Good morning. And welcome to another perfect African dawn. To the east, the embers of the day are beginning to spark again as a gentle breeze from the southeast fans them after a pretty hot day yesterday. It's about 22 degrees Celsius here at the moment. Well, that's what the weather report says, 73 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, Viam and I reckon probably more accurately sitting around somewhere around 18 degrees Celsius, which is, I think, 81, if I'm not mistaken. No, it's not. It's absolute nonsense. Oh, 67. And that's because we are low down here on Twin Dams Road in the middle of Juma Private Game Reserve, a little gem in the sea of wonderful wilderness that is the Kruger National Park. And we, to the west of us is Arethusa. We traverse there as well, 1,500 hectares that we are going to be exploring with you live today on our sunrise safari. My name is James Henry. On camera we have Viam. That's Viam's thumb, everyone. He's just finished his coffee. Viam, was it good? No, it wasn't the best. No, Viam, of course, has the taste in coffee that is uh, beyond any kind of understanding. He enjoys chicory with a sort of chocolate mix. It's disgusting. Uh, on the other vehicle today, we have got Jamie, and she is currently being filmed by Brian, all six feet four inches of him. And in the final control, Louise will be directing, and Kirsten will be abling, ass ably assisting, we hope on the keyboard. That means she will be receiving your tweets. Now, what that means is that we must please ask you to talk to us. Hashtag Safari Live if you're tweeting, or questions at wildearth.tv if you're emailing, or talk to us on the YouTube chat thing. I can never really say that in a smooth function. I'll try at some stage to get that right. We are on Twin Dams Road here. And just to the south of us is where Karula had a kill the other day. And so we're going to go down there and just have a little bit of a look and see if that young kudu that she had in the tree is still there. Um, just to keep you updated, we know that Karula now does have two cubs. They are only about four to five weeks old. Well, just, we know they're just over five weeks old. We will not be viewing them with the vehicle for now. Probably in the next two or three weeks, we will start to try and view them. If we do bump into them, we are allowed to spend 10 minutes there, and then we will extract from the area. So that's what's going to happen if we see the little baby cups. But I think that they have gone south down into the reserve next to us, and so they're probably lying in a little cave having enjoyed a safe evening with their mother, Karula, for the duration of last night. OK, that's all I have to tell you for now. And thank you, Ravi, for your update. You say there were lions calling at some time during the night. Um, I think about 1.20, you said, to the east. So we'll pop around to the east of the reserve. I know Jamie's going that way now. And we'll see what we can find there. It is a gorgeous, gorgeous morning. And of course, that is a word that one should use today because it is the day that the two gorges, Nikki and Scott, are leaving us today. And, well, it's a new dawn for them and a new dawn for us, I suppose, as well. Kimba, you want to know if we had a good party last night? Well, it was a good send-off, I think, yes. Um, it's always slightly tinged with the fact that you have to be up at 4 o'clock in the morning. And so I don't think it went on that late. I folded a little bit earlier than most. But that's why I look so bright-eyed and bushy-tailed to this morning. But I think it was a good send-off. And I think that we will see them again. I have a feeling in my bones about it. So we're just about around where Karula had her kill, so we'll just keep an eye out in the bushes. Hello, Joe in London, while we're driving along, waiting to get to Karula's little stash, little pantry, little kitchenette. Um, you want to know about, or oh, just look on the road here. Yeah, I don't know if you can pick that up. It looks like an enormous snake has been walking along the road, which is uh, not what has happened here at all. That is the trunk dragging of an elephant. An elephant has been walking along here, too lazy to pick up his own nose, and he's left a mark. So it's good just to have a bit of a listen as we start out in the morning, see if those lions don't call their last before the sun comes up. Maybe something will alarm call. And I 
know, Lucy, you said that you heard some alarm calling at about 20 past five at the Juma Dam. Well, we did go past there just after that and didn't hear anything, but we will check up around there. Cool this morning. Then, a question about giraffe while we're driving along here. Which is a perfectly valid question, of course. I've just forgotten who it's from. Um, we want to, you want to know... Joe, you're, it's, you're Joe in London. You're up very, very early. In fact, I suspect you probably didn't get to bed. Um, you want to know if giraffe have vocal cords? You've read that they don't. Joe, um, as far as I'm aware, they do have vocal cords. There's probably a variation of a vocal cord. There are lots of hyena tracks on the road here. Um, but as far as I'm aware, all mammals have them, if I'm not mistaken, or some kind of variation of them. And they can communicate. They communicate with something we call infrasound, which is a sonic uh, range that is too low for us to hear. The frequency is too low. The wavelengths are too long for our ears to hear. <laughs> I just saw this finger emerge from behind the camera. And then I spotted a bird. Is it a Wahlberg eagle or an owl? I think it's a little Wahlbees. Like it might call. Let me just go a little bit further along and see if we can't get a better look. Well spotted, Vim. I see that chippery chocolate mix has uh, sharpened your mind and your eyes. I had my sleep on that. Huh? Ah, yes. Oh, is that thing? It's going to keep going. There's another little gap here that we might be able to see it through. It has hidden itself very cleverly, hasn't it? Sorry, man. Ah, there we go. Just from, the, just from the shape of that bird and his so slightly large head, I would have said that that was a brown snake eagle flying into the dawn sky. All right, let's head across to Jamie, see what she's got to tell us for the morning. I think she's heading north. We're going to continue on south. We'll keep you updated. A very good morning to all of you across the world. And what a glorious start to the morning it is. There's nothing like facing the sunset, driving down a long straight road into the bush and wondering what prospects the morning holds. Definitely put me in a far better mood than I originally started my day with. Some elephants wandered into our garden and pushed over a tree known as a zebra wood. Some of our regular viewers might be familiar with them. I'll look for one to show the rest of you. Zebra woods essentially is a, a tree that has incredibly long spines and is very, very solid. Anyway, they pushed it over at about head height this morning, and since I was driving out in the dark, I definitely encountered more than a slap to the head than I intended to start my day with. But with a view like that, one definitely cannot stay miserable forever. Well done, Wendy. But good morning to you all. My name is Jamie, and I have Brian on camera with me this morning. We're going to head out and see if we can follow up on the calls of the lions that the guys heard last night when they went on a little bit of a game drive bumble for Scott and Nikki's leave farewell party. And Ravi, I think you also sent through an update that you heard lions roaring on the Juba Dam camera. I think it's time for us to go and search for them. So whilst James makes his way towards Karula's Kill to find out what's happening there, I've come up to the northern boundary. I'm then going to cut across down along Cheetah Cut Line, so to the east of the property, and figure out if we can't work out who came through. I've been listening very, very carefully this morning. No sign of anything coming through. Sorry, I'm just listening to the Game Drive channel. Just 
giving Aubrey and James is just giving Aubrey an update on our morning's plans so that the guides can spread out and divide their attention evenly to the different parts of the reserve rather than all of us checking the same place repeatedly. Just make sense to divide and conquer. particular elephant encounter this morning was less with the elephant and more with the havoc that it had wreaked upon our driveway. <coughs> Tom, who is watching in Dallas, was wondering if we've ever seen an elephant step on its trunk or heard of it happening. And Tom, once they're a sort of maturity age, I've never ever seen it happen. I've seen them do some very odd things with their trunks in terms of wrapping them around each other. But it's incredible their level of coordination. I mean, we as people stub our toes and knock our knees and our hips all the time and trip over, maybe it's just me, but trip over our own feet on a regular basis. I've never seen an elephant do that. I've never ever seen it step on its trunk. The interesting thing about baby elephants, when they're very young, they, their trunks are proportionately smaller, so proportionately shorter than those of the adults because there is a chance that they could do something like that. If you've ever watched a baby elephant and the way that they use their trunks, it takes a couple of years before they are as coordinated as the older elephants. Now initially they've got, it's almost like toddlers learning their coordination with their hands. They seem to have that reflex of curl and grasp that all trunks display, but they haven't quite mastered how to use it. And it can be absolutely hilarious to watch a baby elephant trying to learn how to use its trunk and imitating its mom. There's something so, something that we can so easily relate to as humans. I'm just gonna go through this dip quickly. stepping on stepping on its own trunk but babies it's not impossible that's why their trunks are slightly shorter than an adult's might be and while i continue on along the northern boundary let us find out what mr henry is up to and if he's got any updates for you we are at twin dams everybody and the kudu that was the tree that uh, karula killed for herself in order to keep her spirits and nutrition up while she suckles those two babies has gone. I suspect that this is perfectly normal. What happens is they'll eat for a while and eventually it becomes, they've eaten so much that it becomes difficult to keep the, whatever it is in the tree. And I know there was a hyena lurking under the tree yesterday and I suspect the hyena made off with the remains of the carcass and Karula has pressed on to go and see where her little ones are. And that's what's happened. So no Karula at the moment. Probably not for the rest of the day. So we'll head east and see if we can't hear those lions calling again. Hello, Roy. Very interesting question. Why are we only allowed to see the cubs for 10 minutes if we see them? Roy, we don't want to put pressure on her at the moment. So it's obviously a difficult time for her. There's a very sensitive stage of development. They cannot climb trees in an effective way and therefore they cannot get away from potential predators at the moment. What we don't want to do is to get into a position where we are driving around, say we find her, for example, walking down the road here. Um, the vehicle is obviously quite a noisy thing. It's got very odd smells and those, sort, and those sorts of things. And we don't want them to be distracted by the vehicle. And say a hyena comes along or a lion comes along, they must be fully aware that, of what's going on around them so that they can climb a tree and get away from any predator that might attack them. That's why if we do see them, it would be a stop the car, have a view. I mean, if they just walked around here and were playing over here, we probably maybe stay 15 minutes, but certainly we wouldn't want to be making a noise or making a smell around them when they need to have all their wits about them to try and defend themselves from predators. I mean, I think if, if you were on your own reserve, if you were 
the only vehicle in the area and you had complete control over how the sightings were run and how it was all done, then I think you would probably get away with uh, viewing them a little earlier. So if we were, say, a, a, a lone film crew on a reserve, I think it would be possible because you'd be only be one vehicle going in there. But there are hundreds of cars around here um, driving around with lots of people. Everybody wants to see a leopard. Everybody wants, to, everybody wants to see leopard cubs. And it's just much easier to say, let's leave it until she's able to take them up a tree, until they're able to independently assess whether they're in danger or whether they aren't. And that's why, if we see them now, we'll probably just give them some space. And a very good question, to which there's a very simple answer. I think you will probably, um, you may do one of these. You may go, ah, yes, of course. You want to know why it is that herbivores don't den their young? Because, yes, of course, as you say, are they not at greater risk, given that uh, things like to eat them? Leanne, remember, let's take an impala as an example. An impala's got a gestation period of six and a half months to seven months. A leopard has a gestation period of just over three months. Now, there's a similar weight, a similar mass. The impala's slightly heavier, but there's similar mass. And that means, of course, that the fetus of a herbivore is enormously developed in comparison with that of a predator. Now, there are various reasons for that, but the simple reason for why the herbivores don't need a den is that the babies can run from the day that they are born. Remember, they can get up within. We had an amazing, amazing sighting the other day of a zebra being born, and that little foal was up within 20 minutes. Now, a leopard cub is born totally what we call altricial, blind, um, can't hear anything, and it's a little ball of fluff about that big. Tiny, tiny. And it takes a long time for it to be able to actually move around. Oh, very good reasons for it. Interesting little bird. Amassing enough fat so that it might go home. And home, of course, is Europe. That is the red-backed shrike. And he looks like he's got a little bandit's mask around his eyes. And how you identify him from the front. His gray head, his white breast, and then on his back, he's not quite red, but it's a sort of um, deep reddish brown. I knew this was going to come. Louise says he looks like Zorro. Yes, I suppose he does, if one must, um, if one must compare him with a, a human being, then I suppose Zorro must be it. I thought the Lone Ranger myself. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. All the Lone Rangers and Zorro, don't you think? Mm, which Lone Ranger? What do you mean, which Lone Ranger? There are hundreds of thoughts about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get into a lengthy debate about which Lone Ranger it was. <laughs> Hello, Lyle, in Washington. Good question. When does she stop carrying them around by the nape of the neck? So I'm sure many of you have seen footage or pictures of cats being carried by their mothers, and they get picked up exactly like you might pick up a house cat by the scruff of the neck, they have a loose bit of skin there, and that's how they move them from den to den when they're very little. I think, Lyle, you'll find that um, from, hmm, as soon as they can really move, so they're, they're probably, she could carry them now, they could walk now, and I know they were walking around here yesterday, and they're five weeks old, so I'd say probably up to about four weeks, Lyle. So find out what's going on here. They've obviously got more access down there. I'm not sure what the plan is on Chitra Chitra. Jeff? 
sorry, I'm just checking for some tracks here. Uh, you want to know what I would be doing if, if I wasn't doing what I'm doing now? Jeff, I'd probably be um, homeless on the street, trying to grow my own vegetables in a patch of pavement. What do you think, William? Maybe struggling author. Struggling author. Yes, I'm already a struggling author. Um, I don't know, Jeff. I, I mean, I was teaching the guitar for some time before I came here, and I was working on a community conservation project just north of Palabora. Um, so I guess I'm probably been doing one or two of those things. I might also be trying to, uh, you know, become a rock star. Although by the time you've hit my advanced years, um, it's normally happened if it's going to happen. Stop nodding, Liam. Yeah. Vian was nodding vehemently there, saying, yeah, yeah, uh, waste of time there. You better find something else to do. There's always idols. There's always idols, but I think you have to be under 30 to get on idols. And James Taylor, you want to know if a leopard will carry its babies up a tree by the, in the mouth? No, they won't. Um, I suppose they would if they had to. But, or if they were suddenly in the situation where they were found themselves under attack and she was moving them, she might climb a tree with a leopard in her mouth. But no, they won't sort of stash them in a tree by the mouth. Normally the little cubs will learn to climb trees on their own completely, which is rather nice. I can't wait until we actually are able to spend a bit of time with her. I suspect that her time is going to be spent half kind of on the, in the south there on Chitra Chitra and half on Juma. She really, she seems to have split her ways. And as Brent was saying last night, we probably actually had them on Juma because the fact that they were around that kill the other day indicates that they were probably not too far from that all the time. And I wonder if she didn't have a den probably somewhere on Deadwood Road uh, in the drainage lines there. Maybe we just didn't pick it up and that's okay. Absolutely fine. We're going to look at some water buck here and then we're going to stop and listen for the lions calling. Brian Jurgensen, you want to know how long it is before a leopard is able to eat solid food? I think that water buck is heavily pregnant. Um, Brian, they'll start to eat meat from probably as early as six weeks. And they'll be completely weaned by three months. Hmm. I think that female we looked at at the beginning is, is very pregnant. And the waterbuck and the kudu seem to be dropping their lambs and calves, well, they're both calves at this stage. And then you could hear the bearded woodpecker going tick -tick 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 in the background. And another waterbuck cow steaming across the road. Hmm. Daintily. Sorry, just hold on, everybody. Uh, negative orbs, the kudu is gone, so I think yeah, there's nothing there now. Right, marvellous. Louise says it looks like they're wearing uh, scarves with all that fluff on their necks. I suppose it does look a little bit like that, but the interesting thing is, despite the fact that they do look like they've got very sort of thick hair, um, that hair is very sparse because with thick hair, and if it was closely packed together like the fur of most animals, it's so hot out here that it would be almost impossible for them to survive. And so that hair, despite the fact that it makes them look like shaggy teddy bears, if you kind of get close to it, is actually very sparsely spaced. Right, we're now on the eastern boundary, still waiting for the sun to peep up over the horizon. I think it's going to come up very soon. I'm just going to 
keep checking out for tracks on the road. I don't know, you know, those lions, if they were calling it, well, what, 11 o'clock and then 1 o'clock again, they could have gone miles and miles from here. All right, while we do that, let's head across to Jamie, find out what she's doing, get an update there, and I'll catch up with you later. I'm just a little bit of a change of plans since Wendy's being a little bit recalcitrant this morning. It doesn't seem to want to go all the way to the east without us losing picture. But we've decided instead we'll go to a quarantine and see what we can find around there. Now, the reason I stopped here initially was because the guinea fowl were shouting furiously. And that's always a good idea to stop for guinea fowl. They've led me to a couple of leopards in my time in the bush, but they, I think, are Alarm calling at that Warburg's. Oh, here comes a Heidi Dar. Ah! My favorite story is that Heidi Dars. <laughs> Heidi Dars do that and scream like that because they're actually scared of heights and quite frightened of flying. <laughs> well done, Brian. That was epic. But you can sort of imagine it. Heidi Dars flapping furiously going, ah. go. A Wahlberg's eagle, pale morph Wahlberg's. We see them fairly regularly and the cause of the guinea fowl's alarm, although they appear to have now forgotten that it is there in their sort of short-term memory way that they have such a talent for. Apparently, how we look at this beautiful eagle, apparently there was a question about what we would do if we weren't doing this. Apparently James said that he would be homeless it's a very good question. I think if I had to try and decide, I think that I would probably be working as a wildlife vet. I say that very hopefully. It's a very difficult industry to break into. In South Africa, there's only really one university that offers a suitable vets course. And it, the exception, uh, acceptance standards are very, very high. But I think that is what I would like to be doing if I was not doing this. However, it's a difficult decision. I don't, I can't really at this point picture myself doing anything else. What would you be doing, Brian? I'd also be homeless. You'd also be homeless. Yeah. Okay, so we've got two for the homeless <laughs> score. <laughs> I wonder what um, Wildebeest would be doing. Something, it's somehow for me, <laughs> VM would be doing something absolutely, totally different and wonderfully fascinating. Might be a secret agent. In fact, I'm not even sure he isn't a secret agent, come to think of it. Hmm, never thought of that before. Everything makes so much more sense now. <laughs> Oof. It's okay, Wendy. Now, of course, we are all hugely relieved and thrilled to hear that Karula's cubs have survived their first crucial few weeks. But James Richards was wondering, just having had a look at that Wahlberg's eagle, he was wondering whether a bird of prey, for example, like a Marshall eagle, would be a threat to leopard cubs. And absolutely they would be. One of the many things, it's one of the reasons why leopards pick nice, covered, sort of sheltered den sites, and why leopard cubs have such a strong instinct to stay hidden and undercover. Now, James, initially when I first got my dog, who She's now absolutely hefty, a fair-sized Viberana, but at the time I got her, she was about that big. About seven weeks old when I took her to the bush for the first time, and completely unaware, you know, without the wild animal instincts to look up all the time. And I spent the first few months of her life absolutely terrified, paranoid, that she was going to get taken off by a martial eagle or something similar. It does happen. It happens fairly regularly. For some reason, it happens fairly regularly in Natal. Crowned and booted eagles seem to enjoy doing, making off with people's pet dogs. Guinea fowl are upset here now. They're very cross. Mm. Let's just sit and listen for a moment. And 
cackling sound that you can hear it is the guinea fowl, very angry guinea fowl. I wonder if after all of that, there isn't a leopard wandering through that drainage line. There's three main things that guinea fowl alarm call at, apart from people. One is a leopard and a li or a lion. The other is a bird of prey. And then the third is a snake. And it depends on where the guinea fowl are, what particular threat it is. So very often when there is a leopard moving through, they very often take to the tops of trees. Well, I don't see any of them in the top of a tree now. Just keep your eyes peeled for any kind of flash of movement. And I think let's, let's just go and poke our noses into this drainage line. Well, we go and investigate and see what those guinea fowl are alarm calling at. Oren wanted to know, can a predator distinguish between the smell of a leopard cub versus an adult leopard? Yes, I'm, I'm almost certain they can. Since the sense of smell that animals have is so intense, What's the matter, guinea fowl? Let me see if I can see them from here. They're still very cross. It could be a snake. Everybody just keep your eyes peeled. The interesting thing is that it's only guinea fowl at the moment that are alarm calling. So whatever the threat is, the squirrels in the area and the go-away birds in the area haven't spotted it. Hmm. One moment, I'm actually gonna, I'm actually gonna hop out of the car. You can stay with us. I'm gonna hop out of the car and just stick my nose through here since I can't see through the bushes. Let's see if we can't figure out what's upset these guinea fowl in the way it has. There's no need to be concerned. I'm not doing anything dangerous. What's got you so upset? see anything. Now at this point I'm thinking that it's some it might have been a bird of prey that's moving through there or even a genet is also a possibility and the reason I say that is they've tucked themselves into a very thick bush at this point, just walking into that direction and at that distance, if there was a leopard there or a lion or anything like that, it would have actually have moved. It would have been alert to my presence. But it wouldn't have run away. The leopards in particular of the Sabi Sands are very, very comfortable with people on foot. Many of you have experienced that. Brian, you filmed Karula once on foot. An awesome, awesome sighting. Well, I'm going to loop around, try and see if I can see further into the drainage line. While I do that, let's find out what Mr. Hendry's been up to. Well, we're driving down the cheetah cut line, still far east of Juma, seeing if perhaps the lions haven't crossed on. We have seen no evidence of them at all. But we have seen evidence of a little sort of tongues of cloud blowing in here from the east. Now, that is an unusual direction for the clouds to be coming from and I'm just going to get into a high point where you can see them and maybe maybe there is some form of precipitation blowing in the storm from the east over the Mozambique Channel 
Um, maybe Luisi can tell us whether there is anything predicted on the weather. Hello, Sunita. Very nice to hear from you. You're getting hold of us all the way from India. How oh, very nice. Um, and thank you for joining us, and thank you for taking the time to ask a question. You want to know about cheetah. Do we see cheetah here? Is it possible to see them? Sunita, we're actually on something called the cheetah cut line, uh, which is this road. But we don't see cheetah often. Now, if I ask Viam to pan over the landscape here, you can see that it is quite thick. It is full of bush. There is not the kind of easy, open space that a cheetah needs to have to run, that there's a tremendous speed. And then a cheetah will um, either bash its head or, and I'm not joking here, bash its head or kind of injure its belly trying to run through here at, a, at a, you know, 100 kilometers an hour. So we do see them from time to time, but they are not common here at all, Sunita. They'd be much more common in the south of the Sabi Sands, where there are much more open areas. And then, of course, up into East Africa, we know that there are lots of them. Very nice question. Thank you. And please feel free to send further questions, Sunita, all the way from India. I'd love to know where in India you're from. It is a vast and magnificent country. Apparently rain is predicted from Wednesday until the end of the week. Well, I seriously doubt that this is the, uh, the rain front coming in now. This is probably just a, a little, well, I don't know, teaser, perhaps. Of course, what normally happens with these rain predictions is that you, you see them and it says it's going to rain on Wednesday, and then by Monday it says it's going to rain on Thursday, and then by Tuesday uh, the rain has gone completely and you're staring down the barrel of 40 degrees of blinding white sunlight again. That seems to be the case for this summer. We're nearly at the very northern tip now of Cheetah Cut Line. Ah, here we go. And what does normally happen is that it heats up towards the time when we're going to have rain. Tuesday, we're looking at 39 degrees Celsius. That, everybody, is about 102 degrees Fahrenheit, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, this is the beginning of autumn, of course, at 102 degrees Fahrenheit. Sorry, I didn't get that too easy. We're going to have to go again. Cell phones making noise. It's not mine. Yeah. Oh. Not from here, I'm afraid, Luisi. So that just as the sun popped up, this kind of bank of cloud has covered it over. And we shan't be particularly sad about that. Because today, of course, is also voter registration day, which means that we have to go out into the community, some of us, and register to vote so that we might put our important marks on the voting roll come the municipal elections of this year. That is not particularly impressive or interesting given the uh, presidential race going on in the United States. Now, when you get to the point of discussing the voters' roles in the uh, presidential race in the United States, that means that there is no animal to look at. Clown Sharon, you have said something about coffee, which I'm afraid my communications are not particularly strong this morning. Um, you say I'm a connoisseur of coffee. I am indeed a connoisseur of coffee, Clown Sharon. And a very nice dark roast would be a pleasant addition to the morning. I have already had one nice cup of coffee this morning, uh, made by Kirsten McLennan Smith. She's the one who gets up early and puts the coffee machine on, while the rest of us roll about trying to find some kind of, um, well, to find, to find our brains, really, at 4 o'clock in the morning. Okay, we've turned now to the west, onto the northern Buffalo cut line. There have been no signs of lions coming across this way, and so we're going to go and check the dam. Otherwise, I fear me, there are no lions on Juma today. Uh, there might be some on Arethusa, and of course, if you were a guest driving around here, you could quite easily see lions because you would be driving on to Bufusuk and Torchwood, which is well, not where we can drive because our signal doesn't extend that far and we don't have traversing. 
Anyway, that's not to say we shouldn't see a leopard or other magnificent wildlife. Maybe an elephant, that would be nice. Maybe something. A bird, a bird would be nice. Instead of the wilting leaves and the drought-stricken trees. You see how that rhymed there, Vian? No, oh, I wasn't listening. Uh, let me say it again for you. Wilting leaves on the drought-stricken trees. Leaves, trees. That's it. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Let's turn in towards the Beefles Hook Dam. Jamie, at least, is following up on some alarm calls. So with any luck, she'll turn something interesting up. What we're going to do is have one very last listen over here and see if we can't hear anything in the way of alarm calls at two, or perhaps a predator falling its last before the day takes hold. I can hear some zebra going. And they seem to be fighting a bit at the moment, and I wonder if the stallions aren't thinking about breeding again, if this would be the kind of peak mating time. And I heard a really sort of strident whining from a zebra yesterday, and I thought, oh, I think we've got something being killed here, and we found them. And there was actually two stallions having a fight with each other, and as one of them got hold of the other, because they bite, they've got really powerful jaws, and they bite each other horribly, uh, one of them was whining. A large male zebra whining. Very unmanly. like the sound that Andrew Grime and I made when we were trying to catch the rat. Isn't that a tree, then? A road? Yes. No. You don't think it's a giant lion? I wish it is a giant lion. Oh, it's a stump. OK. Right, well, OK. Are you going to, um, are you copying a thief? No. Louise. Oh. Louise. Should we link to Louise? Yeah, good. OK, we're going to link across to Louise for some reason. Um, I think he means Jamie. Why am I not copying? I don't know. I wouldn't say it was a weird reason. I think it's a pretty good reason. Yes, we have found, I'm fairly certain, at least one of the culprits for my morning head injury. Hey, boy, did you come into our driveway and trash the garden? Yep. Look at that face. Definitely, definitely guilty. Well, there we go. You can sort of get an idea since we were talking this morning about elephants stepping on their trunks. They've got the most incredible proprioception. In other words, their spatial awareness is second only really to that of dolphins and whales and humans, and the great apes, of course. They've got these incredibly large brains, and most of it is devoted to emotional development and their proprioception. So even though they've got that blind spot below their head, they can't see anything, they still have that awareness and level of coordination. You can see it, be, it would be possible physically possible for him to step on his trunk, especially with the accordion-like stretching ability that those 100,000 muscles in the trunk provide. Hey, little boy. What's up? That long-legged walk. Even though he looks like he's moving slowly, a stride like that, with two meters between each step, or six feet between each step, or oh, quick dust bath, covers an enormous amount of ground. Oh, here's another one of the culprits. I didn't even see that one. Let's go forward a little bit. He's going to give himself a nice dust bath in the morning light. While I reposition, James has found a tiny little antelope for you. Let's have a quick look. This steel look here seems to have Great and highly unattractive infestation of ticks on its face. Are those ticks or flies, yeah? Ticks. Some of them move like flies, but there is some stationary. I think there are flies. I can see them moving around. They're obviously.
obviously not irritating her because I don't think she could survive. A, well, she couldn't be able to kind of uh, sit comfortably if those were ticks. Can you check your mic for me? Check my mic. Can you hear me now, Viam? Yeah. Um, Molly, you're in Ohio, and you want to know. Uh, you, you read that uh, Dyke are buried there, Dunn and Steenbook don't, and why is that? Uh, it's actually the other way around, Molly. Um, Steenbook will bury their Dunn within their territories. Why don't Dyke do it? Well, I think the question is why do Steenbook, and they do it, of course, because what it does is it it, it hides their scent, so they will leave it out on the ground on the sort of outskirts perimeter of their territories and then inside the territory they'll bury their dung. I don't know why a dike doesn't do it. I don't think a dike is actually as territorial as a steenbok and I suspect oh, they've just got a clever adaptation that the dike don't. I think it's a very good question. Dike is about, mm, well not twice the size, it's about one and a half times the size of that steenbok. All right, let's get it back across to Jamie. She's got some elephants for you. wonderful view of these young bulls in the morning light and when they're at about this age which I would guess at probably around about 20 or so they tend to be a little bit more skittish and a little bit more nervous than the adult bulls tend to be hello boy they usually require a little bit more in the way of personal space the older bulls will very often come forward to investigate and say hello the younger males aren't quite so secure in their, in their size and their strength just yet. That's because they've had the safety and security net of a herd for most of their lives. It's actually quite a considerably traumatic event for a young male elephant, even though their instincts tell them it's time to go off on their own. Having a little bit of company also helps tremendously. Which is why you very often see them in these little bachelor groups. I think I'm going to try roll forward just one more little bit. Try and get the branch out of the way. Yeah, I think that's as good as it's going to get. Nope, still very much in the way. <laughs> Munching away at a buffalo thorn like it means nothing to them. Sit and listen. There's a woodpecker tapping away. Sounds to me, and it is a guess, but it's a fairly educated guess. It sounds to me like a bearded woodpecker that we've been hearing. Hello, boy. You can come say hello. When you're judging the size of an elephant and trying to guess at its age, it's important to remember that just like people, they have genetic differences in their appearance. So looking at the size of the tusks is not an automatic indication of age. There you go, you can hear that woodpecker again. Some elephants just are genetically programmed to have larger tusks than others. To this boy, I think he's actually going to have fairly long, fairly thin tusks when he reaches maturity. Quite often when you, what you'll find with these young bachelor groups is that there'll be a couple of younger bulls that will congregate around an older male, a male sort of 30, year old, 30 years old or older. Oh, excuse you, Mr. Elephant. I'm fairly certain that the third male is in, who is in here somewhere is one of the older ones. It might even be that elephant with the big hole in his ear. It's an interesting, I saw the video of Scott with that elephant and it seems it's definitely the same elephant that Tara had an encounter with Tara being for new viewers Tara being one of the previous presenters who had a very very close encounter with an elephant coming up to have a sniff definitely the same elephant Lucy's question, Lucy's watching in South Bend, Indiana. The 
is young bulls can travel on their own, and the larger males very often do, but they seem to enjoy the company of other males. It's basically a bachelor herd. There's our third elephant. Oh, he's also young, hiding in the back there. Isn't it amazing how a six-ton animal can disappear in the space of about 30 meters or 90 feet, vanishing behind the trees? So, Lucy, when they are males, they can live solitary and move about in a solitary manner, but they do very often come together with other males and form little bachelor herds, particularly when they are younger and when they've just left the herd. And then, of course, the females stay within a group for their entire lives. They will always be with their family, and every elephant within a herd is related in some way, whether it's a sister, an aunt, a cousin, a little female calf born into a herd will be with that family for the rest of her life. <clears throat> come, boy. You're going to come out. This light is stunning. A sighting like this is absolutely filled with peace. And I don't think there is any other animal that can quite impart the sense of wisdom and comfort that elephants can. And I'm not alone in thinking that. I know that most people feel that way. James Richards was just saying, it's amazing how animals, like, oh, the elephants can raise your heartbeat and yet at the same time calm your soul. And I think that is a perfect description. It doesn't matter what sort of mood I'm in, at any point in time, sitting with elephants always transmits a sense of absolute peace. There's one other animal that actually has that effect, and I think it's going to wander onto, oh, no. It was a giraffe that was thinking about wandering towards us, but she's moved off now. As I said about aging elephants and the fact that these are fairly young bulls, Brian Jorkinson, who is one of our regular viewers, has been listening intently to our information and has said, isn't it a good way, isn't it a good way to age elephants by looking at the indentations in their skulls around their temporal region? And yes, absolutely, as elephants start to get older, particularly when they get past the sort of 40-year-old mark, their skin starts to lose elasticity, they lose that subcutaneous level of fat, and as a result, it starts to sag. The, the face starts to sag in the temporal region, and their cheekbones and their skulls become more and more prominent. And that's a very, very good way of looking at an elephant. And then, of course, looking at the size of the head as well is probably a far better indication than looking at the tusk size themselves. These young gentlemen, all of the learning that they have done in the last 20 or so years has been absolutely crucial. And James Blair was wondering, when they do leave the herd, who teaches them or what teaches them to be adult male elephants? Is it the lessons that their mothers have taught them? Is it older males? Or is it instinct? And the answer is it's a very, very much a combination of the three of those things. So whilst mothers might not actively teach them whilst in the herd, they definitely learn by observation. So watching the behavior of other males moving about in that particular group. Then once they leave, it's a matter of instinct and learning by experience. And as I said, they very often join up with older males for a time, not, always, not permanently, but they'll come and go with older males, spend a bit of time with them. And there again, learning by observation is one of the things that elephants are particularly good at. Just watch, for example, with a young baby, watching the others learn, watching the others use their trunks, as we discussed earlier. 
and then attempting to imitate the same movements. Elephants are intelligent enough to learn lessons by experience. Tail swishing away. That's a, very much a sign of a happy elephant. You can judge so much about their mood from the way that the tail moves. So that's swinging from side to side comfortably, ears flapping gently, is a sign of a very peaceful Eddie. Hey, boy. You happy? You happy having destroyed Inga's garden? Yes. There's a couple of giraffe that are now moving slowly across towards the elephant and keeping a very, very close eye on them. They're hidden very much behind the trees. There you go, some spots for you. Now, when we look at giraffes and elephants, we refer to them as their babies as calves. But Kathy's got a question along those lines, which is basically with antelope species, and we'll include giraffe in a bovid sense, so they're still quite closely related to antelope species. Hello. Hello, Gully. Sorry, Kathy. I'll, I'll get back to your question. Let's just enjoy them in silhouette. Coming past. It's the same journey of giraffe that I saw yesterday. There's about seven in this group at the moment. Now, here's an animal that is the antithesis of the elephant's social structure. No set pattern, no set herd pattern. They like each other's company, but there's no group that stays constant for any amount of time. They'll quite happily move off on their own. Essentially the complete opposite in terms of social structure, which is interesting because we're looking at two of the biggest mammals that we have out here, at least in terms of height. There's only one thing that can feed higher or reach higher up than a giraffe can, and that is an elephant reaching, a, ma a large male elephant reaching up high. I'm going to try and see. It's going to make a noise. I wanted to try and get both the giraffe and the elephants in shot. I think we might. Let's see if we can. Luckily, we've got a really subtle start to the vehicle. Just moving nice and slowly. Oh boy, we won't come any closer, it's okay. You can eat your breakfast. Giving me that out of the corner of his eye look. Elephants have, they're the only animal I know that do that. They look at you quite literally like a human does when they're looking at you out of the corner of their eye. Pretending not quite to look at you. There we go. A journey of giraffe. Mostly females and their youngsters. I thought I saw a male around at the back. And there's at least five there that I can count, and two more have moved across behind them. Uh, seven giraffe in total. And I call them a journey. It also can be known as a skyscraper of giraffe which is a bit ridiculous. That might be stretching things a little bit. I once asked a group of school kids what they thought a collective noun for giraffe would be, and my favorite answer was a jumble, a jumble of giraffe. And still to this day, whenever I think of a collective noun for a giraffe, I think a jumble. 
It was adorable. They were very young, very young kids. There was another one that they came up with that was to do with zebra. It was a, what was it? Oh, I'll have to think and try and remember. I'll get back to you on that one. It was also an adorable answer, but my brain's refusing to remember exactly what it was. Now, Kathy, just to go back to your question about, um, you wanted to know, in terms of the naming, since we're talking about collective nouns and correct terminology, you wanted to know a little bit about the naming of antelope babies. We'll ex extend that to all of the youngsters in this particular area. So you're wondering in particular whether all antelope babies are called lambs or if some have calves. And the answer is yes, they have lambs and they have calves and the division happens with the Inyala. So anything smaller than a female Inyala, for example an Impala or a Steenbok, is referred to as a ram or a ewe and their babies are referred to as lambs. So Impala lambs that are born around the sort of month of November, December. Once you get to a kudu bull, so a male kudu or larger, that is where he's resting, just like a person. You know when you shift your weight into one hip? That's exactly what he's doing there. <laughs> taking, taking the weight off his leg. <laughs> like Brent's gonna have to do for the next few weeks. <laughs> so anything larger than an Inyala bull, for example, a kudu is referred to as a cow, a bull, or a calf. In the case of elephants, they have calves. Giraffe also have calves. Buffalo have calves. You've got the leopard and lion cubs, wild dog pups, hyena cubs, because they're more closely related to cats than they are to dogs. And then you start getting to the confusing ones like baby mongoose and baby honey badger. I was desperately trying to think last night what a baby honey badger is called. Pretty sure it's a cub. But now that I say that in the, in the light of day, in the light of day, it seems a bit odd. It made a lot of, it made a lot more sense last night when I was thinking about it. Hmm, well I'll put that question to you. What is a baby honey badger called? Because I should know, but I'm struggling this morning. I couldn't begin to tell you what it is. to go back to my comment about the leaning elephant and Brent's grievous injury. Kimber apparently asked earlier, um, or commented that it, maybe Brent's injured hamstring was the reason he's not on drive. Uh, he's not on drive because he's actually still on leave at the moment. However, he has grievously wounded himself in the cricket match, slightly overextended the same, the same hamstring that popped out of place during the great race of 2016 across quarantine with Mr. Hendry. And I won't go into any further detail. I'll leave that particular conversation to James. Oh, that's beautiful. Hello, boy. Ah. Uh, I should have got that. Apparently, baby honey badgers are called kits. So like a baby ferret is called a kit, and I suppose the Mastilidae, very closely related. How about boy? <laughs> Our journey of giraffe wandering through, watch, keeping a very close eye on the elephant. And as our giraffe move across and hopefully out into the open area of quarantine where we can have a nice close look at them, but how awesome is this with elephant and giraffe, two iconic animals of Africa. And as our giraffe slowly moves through towards the clearing, Eric has said that he's noticed that giraffe have hair on their lips and was wondering why. Morning, Eric. It's as always fantastic to have you on the show. Eric, it's, they sort of function in a very similar way to whiskers. So especially when giraffe lean in close to thorny trees and they have to close their eyes, it gives them that extra level of proprioception. So essentially feeling with their lips before they nibble around the leaves and thorns that they get. So it's very, very, very tactile part of their 
bodies. And if you look at them, that whole structure of the way their lips are structured, the dexterity that they have, and the way that they're able to negotiate thorns if they choose to, otherwise they just pop them straight into their mouths, but nibbling away at the shoots and the bases of leaves. And then the position of their nostrils, and I swear the more you look at giraffe nostrils, the weirder they start to look. They've got this sort of flat positioning, and as soon as they lean into a thorny or a spiky tree, immediately those nostrils shut. So everything about a giraffe's face is that long, narrow nose for reaching into trees. Everything's adapted for the way that they feed. Those long, long eyelashes, which elephants have as well, also very useful for making sure the eye isn't injured in the process of feeding. I'm going to go scoot forward a little bit. Our elephants are still here, although our giraffe have slowly moved off. And while I loop this elephant, Mr. Henry has found a pig to show you. We found a pig, everybody. Yes, I know it's at about 700 paces, but at least it's a pig. It's a heartbeat. It's something to look at. And he's, uh, he's very confused, you see, because he's down through a drainage line, and he doesn't know or not if we can see him. Look how far away he is. <laughs> That's so cool. Liam, I don't feel that you're nearly impressed enough that I managed to spot that pig. Oh, okay. Because you want me to spot a leopard, isn't it? Mm. Yes, fair enough. We did have some male leopard tracks. We went towards Bivol's Dam. We had some male leopard tracks. I'm pretty sure, though, that they are old. We had male leopard tracks around there. They looked like there was quite a lot walking on top of them. So we didn't spend a great deal of time trying to follow up. I've been very interested in how the condition of the warthogs has been maintained. Hello, Kimba. <laughs> you say that Brent hurt his hamstring and you wonder if that is why he is not on drive. Uh, no, that's not why he's not on drive. He's not on drive because he's on leave. He just came back to say goodbye to Scott, um, but otherwise he would be on drive. His hamstring, while um, certainly looked to be quite nastily hurt when we first saw him yesterday, after the party got going last night, uh, his dancing would indicate very little ill effect, to be honest. I suspect this morning his hamstring is going to be very, very sore when he eventually wakes up. <laughs> but he's on leave for another four days. Hello, Sunita. You're in, as I asked you, I said, where in India are you from? You say you're from Bangalore. It's very nice to know that. Thank you very much for that. And there's just a starling up there, if you wouldn't mind, Liam. I don't like I know starling's not your favorite. And you say you would very much like to see a cheetah. Well, Sunita, so would we, and certainly we'll do our best to try and find one. Now, that starling, you can see, shining, beautiful iridescent greens and purples and blues, with his little yellow eye, is either a Cape Glossy Starling or a Greater Blue Eared Glossy Starling. And he's just had his morning constitutional. Isn't that nice to see, Vian? Mm-hmm. Yes, very nice. There we go. He waited for us to come past, lifted his tail, did his business, and will fly off to find some insects to eat. That's what they eat. Now, they become almost tame, those starlings, so if you go into a park around the Kruger National Park, you find them everywhere. So, Spara, a nice question in Ontario about the cheetah and what I say that this habitat isn't ideal for them. They can't chase their prey through an area like this, but how, you say, then can wild dogs? They seem to do it very successfully. Well, wild dogs, of course, hunt as a pack, and so they hunt in a different manner. Uh, they do run their prey down in, in a sort of similar way, in so much as they're not stalking predators, they're forcing predators. Remember, they hunt in a pack, 
They don't run anything like the same speed that a cheetah does. A cheetah runs at 60 miles an hour. That's 100 kilometers an hour. Oh, sorry. Quickly, we're going to go across to Jamie. And very well done to Brian, who's spotted probably one of my top five favorite birds of prey and could well be an explanation behind some very skittish guinea fowl that we've been hearing all morning. Uh, this is an African hawk eagle, a specialized bird hunter. And particularly, and I, I've seen a couple of African hawk eagle kills, particularly specializing in guinea fowl hunting and, I, and Franklin hunting. And I'm pretty sure that is why the Franklin was so upset and why they were hiding deep in the thickest part of the bushes that they could find. They were escaping from this particular bird of prey. Quite actually surprisingly uncommon, which is why I'm sort of twisting around looking. It's surprisingly uncommon to see just one of them. Unlike most of the raptors, which although they mate for life, they tend to hunt separately, African hawk eagles hunt as a pair, with one flying higher, one flying lower, utilizing their excellent eyesight in order to hunt down. Oh, I think I actually just saw it. I'll keep checking as we move, when we move along. But very, very, very common to see them together in trees. Quite unusual to see one on its own. But that definitely, to me, one of the most attractive of the raptor species. And if you could be so obliging, Mr. or Mrs. Hawk Eagle, you would very kindly turn around in this beautiful morning light. I would be supremely grateful so that we can show the viewers that barring across your chest. Any luck? No. Oh well, it was worth, definitely worth the effort, but apparently my communication skills don't quite extend to birds of prey. Those speckles of white make for a very, very striking bird. Tiny, in terms of eagle size, one of the smaller ones, and that makes for an incredibly agile raptor. The birds of prey, like the African hawk eagle, just about the same size as a Wahlberg's eagle, and then the smaller goshawks, for example, they're the ones that specialize in the low level sort of flying and hunting, being able to bring their wings in and duck between the branches of trees to catch their prey on the ground. Now they weren't nesting originally, there was a pair nesting on Central Road when I first started working here. I don't think they've been that successful. It's been a long time since we've seen them around that area, but it could well be the same pair, or at least this could be part of that same pair. Surveying the area with binocular vision that make raptors such fearsome forces to be reckoned with. Come on, beautiful. Can you give us a turnaround? Ooh, is he gonna go? There he goes. There you can see the barring on the chest. And Brian, once again, demonstrating how incredibly fortunate we are to have such a talented cameraman. Awesome. Well done, Brian. Right, I'm going to continue on. We've actually got our journey of giraffe a little bit further ahead. So while I try and catch up with them, let's head back across to James because apparently we interrupted him right in the middle of a question. Right, we're back again. Very nice to see that African hawk eagle. Um, I'm surprised that it was on its own. I'm sure, Jamie. Um, we were just nattering about the why it is that we see wild dogs here and how they're able to hunt so successfully around here when cheetah cannot. And I was saying because wild dogs hunt in a pack, and so the strategy is different. They are where they wear their prey, prey down by running sort of all sides of them, and they don't run anything like the speed of a cheetah. A cheetah runs 60 miles an hour, 100 kilometers per hour, which makes it almost completely impossible to, I mean, you can't run at that speed through bush like this. Whereas a wild dog will e easily manage to kind of nip through the bush here. So that's why. 
It isn't actually, while they are both chasing their prey down, the strategy is actually completely different. And it's interesting, you know, you don't have to be the fastest predator in the world here to be successful, but you often have to be the most stealthy. So a leopard, while extremely fast off the mark, I mean, very, you know, show over a short sprint is very good indeed. I mean, it's nowhere near as fast or as full of stamina as a wild dog or a, che or a cheetah, and yet they are the most widely spread of all of the cats, stretching all the way from southern Africa up through the continent, through the Arabian desert, uh, down through into India and up over the top of the Himalayas, and eventually they finish up somewhere around the far east of Russia, down south of Vladivostok. And that's the same species all the way, which I think is just absolutely astonishing. Michigan, you want to know if I, if I ever don't want to get up in the morning, if I ever wake up and think, oh gosh, is it not a little bit early and can't I just go back to sleep? Do you ever feel like that? Every morning. Every morning. Um, <laughs> Alison, I actually don't. I used to. I used to very much. Um, when I was a guide, I used to find it very difficult to get out of the bed in the morning, but that's because we had to sit with our guests at night until they went to bed. And so while they used to just sleep off the middle of the day, we were normally doing bits and pieces. And so I found it very difficult. But now I try and go to bed a bit earlier. And that means that if I have enough sleep, then it's easy to get up. And it's just so worth it, you know. And I never used to believe people when I was your age, Alison. I used to think that people who thought that the dawn or the middle of the morning, you know, the early light was the most ridiculous time to be out of bed. And is a branch. There's a branch. And when I am up, when I am up, I must just say that it's the most fantastic time of the day to be around. Anyway, let's head across to Jamie. She's got some tall animals, not Brent, something else. I've counted eight giraffe moving through quarantine, which I think for me is a personal record since I started working at Juma. Absolutely lovely to see such a big group of them together. I've seen up to 20, 25 giraffe together before, but not in this particular area. The giraffe here tend to be a little bit more solitary. There's the largest male of the group. Having a look, nope. She obviously did not smell like he wanted her to. Moving off straight away. Two females, fairly young, particularly the one in front, is only just past the sub-adult stage. In fact, barely even reaching the adult age. A very special sighting for it. Nice for those of you out there, and I know there's one or two viewers for certain that are absolute giraffe nuts and love them. They are fascinating animals to watch. Also incredibly peaceful. There's a certain grace to the way in which they move. There's a very good question from Sammy watching in Texas. Something I haven't actually thought about. Now, we've often seen snakes in trees around here. You were wondering, what happens if they find one of those? I'm going to reposition as I answer you, now that they've moved a bit further from the road, so they feel a bit more comfortable. Now, I imagine in a giraffe's case, it would rear back and immediately move away from the tree itself. An elephant would also do something similar. They really don't like a small movements, so mice, little birds, anything like that tends to upset them terribly. So I think that the, probably the most likely reaction is to move away. 
I'm just wondering whether giraffe or elephants ever get... Uh, elephants, I think, is fairly unlikely. I think they're far more aware. But I wonder if giraffe ever get bitten on the nose or if there are any recorded cases of that happening. I've never heard of it happening, but that doesn't mean that it isn't the case. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's actually nine in this particular group. Definitely the most I've ever seen, Brian. Yeah. Brian's been here for far longer than I have. Brian thinks it is. One of the largest groups we've seen, or at least for a good period of time. Awesome. That's very special. I wonder if the drought has brought them together or if it's just a sheer coincidence. As I said, they don't have set herd structures. They will happily move about on their own. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, it's definitely nine. They'll happily move about on their own and then come together and then move apart once again. Sorry, just listening to the uh, game drive updates, but it does not apply to us. There are lion tracks on cheetah plains, which will in the future apply to us, but not today, not just yet. So cheetah plains for new viewers, since that would have been very out of context, is one of the other properties in the northern Sabi sands, and one that at the moment we don't have traverse rights on, but that's being changed. Hello, Zebra. What are you running from? Little jog through the area. And Lauren, I have been looking. Lauren, and I'm sure many others, would like to know if the baby zebra that was filmed giving birth live by you, Brian. No, no it was Dave. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, it was Dave. Um, with James, it was filmed giving birth on quarantine, and Lauren was wondering if we've seen it. And no, we haven't, but I have been looking. I've been checking very carefully around a quarantine area. This looks like one male on his own, from what I can tell. <coughs> oh, excuse me. That took me very much by surprise. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> it took me and the rest of you, I assume, but very much by surprise. Oof, it's the dust. Uh, it's definitely just one stallion on his own. Well, an interesting question that I don't fully know the answer to, but I can sort of guess at, and comes from PK. And PK was wondering if zebras have a different vocal or larynx structure to that of a domestic horse on the basis that they've, he's definitely heard or they've definitely heard zebras making sounds that are outside of the normal range of a domestic horse. And my answer to that is probably yes, to an extent they do. I think every different species has a slightly different vocal cord arrangement. So PK, I would say yes. They would have a different... Oh, is there some courting going on there? Or is it just... I think it's just affection. No, nope, it's... Just a little bit of affection between mom and daughter, I would say. It's two females, a young calf. Not often you get to see giraffe doing that. It's really sweet to witness. I'm... Most of our giraffe have moved off the road and into this block, so we'll settle for this view at the moment. Here we go, she's going to wander out nicely. Look at that colour in the sun. PK, sorry, to finish off your question, every animal has a different, a slightly different arrangement of vocal cords, no matter how closely related they are. So, for example, Leopards make a very different sound to lions, but they're still classed together as one of the panthera family. So the roaring cats. 
And zebra and domestic horses would be something similar. Zebra, of course, make the most phenomenal yip, 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 yip sound. And I'm pretty sure that's the best impression ever, anyone has ever done of a zebra. <laughs> but they do have a very wide vocal range. They are capable of whinnying, though, in a way that's very similar to domestic horses. I've heard them do it once or twice. But for the most part, different species equals a different vocal range. Drive along that two track and see if we can get to the other side of those giraffe. Now, I mentioned earlier when I was answering Kathy's question about the naming of the different baby antelope species, I sort of grouped giraffe together with them. And Deborah, who is our armchair, self-described armchair traveler, has asked, are giraffe classified as antelope? And they're not but they're grouped very closely related. And the reason behind that, one of the most unifying aspects of it is because they are ruminants, just like antelope. They've got the same hoof structure, so the extended two toes that form each half of a hoof. And that puts them together in the bovids, so more closely to buffalo, but all of those together fall under the ruminants category. So antelope and buffalo and giraffe, which is why I lump them together because they have very similar terminology in terms of naming. So even-toed ungulates, as well as ruminants. Even-toed ungulate, even toes, one, two. Two parts of their hooves. Whereas with zebra, they have a completely different naming structure and a completely different digestive system. So they fall in a separate classification under odd-toed ungulates, if you're interested in that particular aspect of them. All right, so I think I'm going to leave our journey of giraffe for now. In the meantime, James has found a monkey to show you. So not a brilliant picture of monkeys, I'm afraid, but that is not the fault of VM. This is the fault of the enormous tree that they have climbed into. And so there's, it looks to be just two of them. And I don't know if you can see that slight blue tinge there in the bottom right-hand side of the monkey you're looking at. That, of course, is why it is called de blow up in Afrikaans. That means the blue ape. And it's called that because of that very bright blue there we go. There you can see it now. Bright blue scrotum that a male vervet monkey has. And they only get that when they're old and be, when they become dominant, and then they change to that bright blue color. So it's a sort of, sig it signifies the fact that they're fully mature and big and strong as they're going to be. And I mean, I know he doesn't look like much there, but. It, Compared with the little female, he's actually quite a large, large monkey. And the sun is, I'm afraid, shining in my eyes as I look up there, Viam. I can't see him anymore. We are now in the Mlwati drainage line. I have found one Nyala which ran away and one Daika which ran away. Thankfully, Jamie is more competent than I am, and she has managed to find you some interesting animals as we've gone along. Um, we're going to do a boat ride now down the Mbilagawati. We'll see what we can find there. I'm hoping for some elephants and maybe a male leopard. There's a little bird in here. Oh, I think it's, 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 a, it's a tawny flanked prinia. I'm just going to see if you can hear it. I might be able to pull it out. It might actually be a green-backed Cameroptera. It's in here now. I'll make a sort of an alarm calling sound. Have you got him? There he is. Tawny flank premier. Give me a monitor. Brilliant. You're, you're a genius. <laughs> that is a tawny flanked premier, everybody. We don't get good pictures of them like this. And look, he's standing in amongst the ripening quarry berries. That is brilliant. Well done, Viam. Good job. Ah. 
That's so cool. We so seldom see them. We hear them all the time, especially on like a hot summer's day. A tawny flanked pinion. So for those of you who don't have him on your list, I mean, I suspect many of you won't. Add him. Tawny flanked pinion. I don't even need to show you a picture because the picture that VM showed you was too good. You want to know when the birds are going to leave here, how soon they're going to start heading north from here. Well, Anna Marie, it uh, really does depend on the bird, to be honest. Uh, but uh, the swallows are going to leave pretty soon. I think you'll find that um, the red-back shrike will... Well, they won't go immediately. They'll take a little while still. But I think by the end of the month, a lot of them will start to leave, and by the end of April, everyone will be gone. But they'll come back, they'll come back. So we'll just look along here and see what we can find. And of course, on a Sunday, it's always nice to just have a bit of a relax, I find. Uh. Oh, Miss Jin in Dallas, you... <laughs> I wanted to know if your bald eagle is larger than the eagles we get out here on a lovely Sunday morning drive. Uh, Miss Jin, the bald eagle is larger than the fish eagle, but I don't think it's as big as the marshal or the crowned eagle here. I think that you if I'm not mistaken, I might be mistaken, but maybe your golden eagle is a little bit larger than some of our biggest, but I think you'll find that the biggest eagles, I mean, the biggest eagle in the world, of course, is the harpy eagle of um, Asia. And I think that you'll find that the gold, your golden eagle and your bald eagle are very similarly sized to our martial and crowned. All right, Miss Jin, while I uh, relax here on my Sunday morning drive, we'll head you back across to Jamie and see what she's found. Sounds like James is having a very enjoyable Sunday. Cruising through the Mawati with his feet up. We are still with our giraffe. I've actually been trying to get past them, but they keep moving ahead of me. It's such a wonderful opportunity that I don't want to waste it. It's not often that we get to experience giraffe in numbers like this. Amazing, we can go for weeks without seeing one. And then all of a sudden we have nine wandering around stopping to nibble on a particularly delicious looking tree. There's something about the iconic nature of a giraffe walking through the African bush. It's one of the things, because I often take some of the, or I have in the past, often taken local kids from the communities that live neighboring reserves that have never ever been into them and never seen a wild animal before in their lives and my experience with taking them into the bush for the first time is they want to see two things three things one is a lion the other is a zebra and the other is a giraffe and that is what they get the most excited about although the lions can be a little bit scary for the younger kids giraffes slowly wander off. They have been playing camera shy in the last few minutes. Eric was just wondering, are lions or leopards a threat to a giraffe? And the answer is yes, absolutely. We'll start with the leopard question. In general, that tends to be the much larger male leopards that earn reputation as giraffe killers. I know the Anderson male has managed to take down a young giraffe, which is an incredible feat when you think about it because despite the fact that he is easily 100 kilograms, so about 250 odd pounds, a young giraffe is still a good couple of hundred kilograms, at least double the weight. It goes to show just how extraordinarily powerful these animals are. The fact that they've also been known to hoist 
so drag a giraffe up into a tree is also one of those mind-boggling facts imagine dragging something at least equivalent to your own body weight up a tree using only your mouth and your fingernails you can get an idea of just how extraordinary leopards really are now lions there are certain lion prides particularly when there is a male with them trying to get you a nice view of these giraffe but they've all decided to hide behind the trees um, there are certain prides of lions that are actually known as specialized or have become specialized giraffe hunters there we go i'll try and stop for this guy and what they do it's particularly prevalent in kruger what they do is they chase giraffe towards the tarred roads where the giraffe have very little traction they often fall down and as soon as they're on the ground then the lions have a distinct advantage now, a lion pride like the Inkuhumas with five females. <laughs> Sorry, my train of thought is completely derailed. Mr. Hendry, on his river cruise at down the Mulwati, <laughs> is now stuck. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I, I'm happy to go and rescue him if he needs rescuing. I am, however, going to laugh very very loudly <laughs> well um we'll wait for him to call us shall we brian mm. oh i really hope he calls us <laughs> right mr hendry <laughs> mr hendry will at some point be back with you <laughs> if he manages to dig himself out of the sand that is quite an impressive feat possibly maybe driving with legs involved well they <laughs> getting regular updates from final control as to what's happening on that vehicle however they have now turned the camera to the side so i can no longer keep you informed and we'll let you know when they manage to get themselves out <laughs> i can't even remember what i was talking about oh it was lions i was <laughs> I was talking about lions. Now, a pride like the Nkuhumas with five females would be unlikely, I say unlikely, it's not impossible, but unlikely to tackle a giraffe, particularly, if, for example, the size of this male. And that's because they generally tackle the smaller prey unless a male lion is present, at which point their prey selection changes dramatically. They go for the larger buffalo rather than the sub-adults. They'll go and take down large male buffalo large kudu and even giraffe and that extra 150 kilograms of the males make makes an enormous a difference in terms of their hunting munching away And wonderful to hear from a viewer that I actually haven't heard from in a, quite a long time. But Sibu Sisu, a.k.a. the Black Mamba from Hummins Kral, is watching the show and wants to know if giraffe sort of take a special position when they give birth or how do they sort of mitigate the fall. You can't imagine a baby having to fall that distance. And the answer to that is incredibly poor giraffe, poor baby giraffe really do have a shock to their first beginnings of their lives where they, if mothers do not lie down to give birth, they will give birth standing up. They might widen their legs slightly, but generally the birth is a two meter drop. Giraffe can, sorry, when I say they don't, you never, you never speak in absolutes in the bush. So a giraffe may lie down to give birth but for the most part they give birth standing up there's a lot of guide rumors and i definitely would term them rumors that that initial shock is necessary for the baby giraffe to take its first breath and whilst i certainly think it would cause the giraffe baby to take its first breath it's not necessary that comes instinctively now, that enormous drop is something that they have to endure in their first moments of life luckily like most baby things they are quite bouncy in their own way you 
just like young children. Maybe I shouldn't say that. Maybe I shouldn't say young children are bouncy. You know what I mean, though. They very often fall over in ways that would hurt us as adults, but their bones tend to be soft and it doesn't hurt them quite so much. Maybe I'm just feeling a little bit old today. Now, interestingly, looking at the, speaking about baby giraffe, looking at those ossicones, this is one thing that sets giraffe very much apart from the antelope. So although they're part of the bovids, they are separate from antelope, as per Deborah's question, they are born with those horns, or ossicones is the proper term, because they're not true horns, on the top of their head. But in order to ease the passage of the baby and make sure that they don't injure the mother, they're born as very floppy cartilage, so the ossicones actually lie flat. And if you're fortunate enough to witness a baby or see a baby giraffe just moments after its birth, those ossicones lie flat. And then in the next few hours, in the next few days, they start to stand upright. What spooked that female? I think just, probably just a bird. She's relaxed again. She did a little bit of a canter. Giraffe only have two speeds. One is a walk, the second is a gallop. Yes, very different style of horn, the ossicones. Now, we've spoken a bit about the possibility of lions hunting giraffe. And obviously in this herd, it would be quite a, something interesting to witness. And Zuby Jody was wondering whether or not other giraffe would try and protect each other from predators in terms of, in a, maybe in a similar way to the way that buffalo often do. They very often chase lions off their kill. And the answer is yes, possibly. It has been known to happen, but particularly where a baby giraffe is involved, the mother will be incredibly protective. And do not be fooled by the giraffe's sort of gentle and seemingly slow nature. They are incredibly powerful animals, and they have been known to kill lions in the past. It just takes one well-placed kick to really do some serious damage. And I'm sure I remember Brent telling me a story about a leopard that they saw that was kicked in the head by a giraffe, and they were convinced it actually died. He said it was all over the Game Drive channel. This must have been back in his Londolozi days. I've personally only ever seen giraffe try to kick lions, and I've seen them connect a few times. And it really gives you an idea. I mean, the life out here is so tough and incredibly brutal at times. But it really gives you an idea of just how resilient those animals are, because I've seen lions take kicks to the ribs. I've seen them being thrown into the air, and they somehow get right back up and carry on. I suppose when you start out life like a baby giraffe, falling two meters, you have to be tough in order to survive. Now, all nine of our giraffe, as far as I can tell, have disappeared. But we shall continue on. Let's see if we can't find Mr. Hendry's baby zebra along Quarantine and Zoe's Road. The Ukuhumas were around Red Dam yesterday. We never found them and I had to move out of the area due to signal issues. But I'm also going to be keeping an eye out for their tracks because they quite often move between Arethusa and Wuertela. And they have a fairly set path that they tend to walk. I know that Aubrey and Taxon have been checking this area. They haven't called in any tracks crossing, but you never know. They might have still been on their way. contemplating, almost contemplating calling James. Oh, I think it might be half time. Um, I'm almost contemplating calling James on the Game Drive channel and just inquiring as to whether or not he would like some assistance. What do you think, Brian? I think you should call him. <laughs> okay, he seems to be, he does seem to be out of the Mulwati and safely moving. And we'll stop for one last view of a giraffe since Look at the scar on her shoulder. That's interesting. That could well have been from a previous lion attack. Here you go. A little bit of a ridge there. Looks very strange. Hello, girl. You've been far more obliging than the rest of them. See the tufts of hair on top of her? 
And then if you look really, really closely, you can see the hairs on the lips that Eric was asking about earlier. No, don't go, girl. Ah. Well, yes, you could, if you looked really closely, see the hairs on her lips, those long eyelashes and those strangely flat nostrils. Oh, I don't think she appreciated that comment. And in updating you, James has not actually found his way out for Mawati. He just happened to be VR, so virtual reality rigging, recording himself trying to dig himself out. However, he has been saved the indignity of having to call me <laughs> by the arrival of a game drive vehicle that is now going to assist in pulling him out. He thinks he might have got away with it because he didn't have to call me, but he hasn't. He definitely hasn't. This is going to be a conversation we have a little bit later. I almost want to go and watch. <laughs> what a way to start your Sunday morning. He thought he was going to have a nice lazy drive up the Mawati. <laughs> Just one, one last view of our giraffe. And we have a question through from Natasha, who's watching in Ontario. Natasha was wondering how many teeth a giraffe have, a giraffe has, sorry, and the answer, Natasha, is 32, most of them sitting sort of towards the back, obviously the molars being the most important of the teeth in ruminants, and then their incisors, also useful for stripping away leaves and trees, leaves and bark. There you go, you can see her quite happily browsing on an acacia a tree with those large white thorns behind an apple leaf now thank you girl <laughs> i'm sorry i'm still chuckling at james i'm laughing like i've never been stuck but of course i have done it myself And final control has come up with a very good idea. So what we're going to do is I'm going to stay with you on an auditory level, just, just in case, but we're going to pop over and find out what is happening on James's vehicle. So let's just have a quick look. little bit of a background view of the rescue mission. Oh, we should have been there, Brian. We should have been filming them. Mm. And they will never know, and you all have to keep that little trip onto James's vehicle a secret. They don't know that we jumped on the back of their vehicle for a moment. And we'll keep that a secret. You can... Yeah, let's not tell him. We'll, we'll see how long we, we manage that. I'm sure he must have expected something similar. I know I would have. All right, I think finally our giraffe sight, I keep saying this, but I think that our giraffe sighting is finally over and it's time for us to move on. Let us see what we can find. Before I do, there's an Inyala bull there looking intently off into the distance. I wonder what he's heard. Let's just see if he, re let's just watch his body language for a second, see if he relaxes again. Oh, on cue, definitely relaxing. We seem to be getting all of the really attractive animals this morning. And there's nothing quite like an Inyala bull with their tan stockings. I don't, I don't know how else to term, what else to term them. They really do look as though they're wearing sort of we call them knee-high socks, stockings. Reaching right down to the base and the shoots of the plants. All right, I think let's go find James's baby zebra. Carol, you were wondering 
um, whether or not there is a lot of cursing involved when unsticking yourself from getting your vehicle stuck. And that is one of the reasons why you stayed with my audio and not James's, just for proprietary and safe family viewing's sake. Yes, there is, there is a choice combination of, of, of words that you can employ when such momentous occasions occur. I employed a couple of them myself this morning when I got smacked in the, in the head, the back of the head by a zebra wood at half past four in the morning. It's not a nice way to wake up. It's not, it's not the way you want to start your day. <laughs> um, we'll see. We'll keep trying to maybe pop across to James every now and again whenever something interesting or exciting happens. And hopefully we'll get the moment where you can all applaud along. Now I had something very similar and in fact it was in this block here and it was with Brian. Um, we were driving following Tingana. It was with you Brian the first time. The second time, there shouldn't have been two times, but the second time was with Andrew. But Brian and myself, we were following alarm calls. We went racing into this block and we encountered Tingana and he was it was an awesome sighting. He was walking all along, ducking between, from marula tree to marula tree. He was calling that deep, harsh, sawing sound and spraying and scraping his feet, slowly making his way, I think, towards where Shadow was at the time. And Brian and I were happily following along and I saw some holes and I thought, okay, we better dodge those. And I saw really what I thought was a solid looking patch of ground and I drove forward, switched off. And as I did, the ground just went gone completely collapsed under me. It was an old art fark burrow that we'd driven over that just didn't have the strength to stand up to our to the weight of our vehicle. And speaking of weighty things, we've heard of elephants ahead of us. But yes, that, that was a good, we just watched Tingana slowly walk away from us and there was nothing we could do. I was up to the entire back wheel was completely we were resting on the axle of the vehicle. It was terribly embarrassing, particularly since I think I was quite new to this job at the time. And it took us a good hour and a half to get rescued. Eventually Eugene came to our rescue, racing out in the Mahindra, which briefly got stuck itself because it was an absolute minefield of art fart burrows. So all in all, not my finest hour. I do sympathize with James does happen. It was even worse when it happened the second time around, but that time I was determined to dig myself out. The elephant having a scratch. Ah, oh, sorry girl. There we go. Unfortunately, they are heading into some thick bush. At the moment, because of the drought, I'm not going to try and push them or stress them any further. Elephants have been a little bit on edge. They've got much further to walk between water points and they have to spread out further in order to get the food that they need in order to sustain their body size. And as a result, it's made a couple of them a little bit more on edge than usual. So we could try to follow them into this block, but all that would happen is they'd just keep moving ahead of us. So as we watch them wander forward, Kelvin was wondering, will the elephants leave us in the dry period or do they stick around? And the answer is we're actually going to see, particularly this year, we're going to see more and more elephants coming in from the Kruger. And the reason I say that is because I've just come from that section directly or the section sort of to the south and to the east of us within Kruger Park itself. And of course, we're open to the boundary. Torchwood's boundary sits on the Kruger National Park boundary, all without fences. And I've been through there and there is literally hardly anything for them to eat all around the river systems, which obviously maintained water. Brrr, yes, noisy things. Obviously maintained water. So they were coming across, animals were utilizing that area more and more and they've had no rain. So there's basically no grass there. There are no water points within that particular western section of the Kruger. So I think we're going to see far more elephants moving through. And already I noticed a big difference in terms of where the elephants were distributed. So my guess 
is that we're going to see more in these areas because they've pumped water holes around Biffles Hook and Juma and all of the different land, parcels of land have their own water source. And then, Calvin, you were wondering about Rothschild's giraffe? No, the only giraffe species that we get is the Southern African giraffe species, or subspecies, depending. There's a, there's a couple of different arguments about that with evolutionary biologists. But no, we don't get Rothschilds in this area. The only subspecies we get is the South African. Unfortunately, I think we'll have to wait for a view of these, a nice view of these elephants. They'll move nicely towards quarantine at some point. we should have packed some peanuts because Krista, who is nine years old, was wondering, is it true that elephants love peanuts? And I don't think that they love them any more than they would love nuts. And if you wanted to really make an elephant happy, you would offer them fruit, which of course we, we don't do because we don't want to feed the wild animals. But yes, Krista, they will definitely eat peanuts. It's not something that naturally occurs here, though. So you'd have to, it would have to be a strange situation where they would go out and find peanuts. Maybe if they raided somebody's drink stop, they might find some. And bravo, I think we can all applaud because James has managed to extricate, extricate himself from the Mawati drainage line. How long did that take? About, about half an hour, not bad. Right, well, since he has managed to free himself and he's found another animal for you, let's find out what James has to say. Now, everybody, the scavengers gathered, of course, because they saw me stranded. That is a Batalier eagle waiting to see if there was going to be any meat in the offing. Not the only scavenger here, of course, just close by a hyena lying on the ground in front of us as a result of what sure? can only be described as the most profoundly stupid piece of driving ever undertaken in the low felt of South Africa since Louis Trichard brought his ox wagon over the Drakensberg Mountains circa 1825. It was after that, wasn't it, 1850 something. Anyway, um, I was driving along. You saw how I was driving along, and I thought that the car would just merrily make its way along, and it didn't. It veered slightly to the left and into a hole. I must say that the hole was very obvious. It wasn't a hole that just snuck up on me at all. I just thought that we'd probably go through it. There was a lot of rods as well. A what? A lot of large holes. Yes, it was a large hole, and VM said to me, um, he said, there is a large hole in front of you, he said. And I said, no, don't worry about that. And the next thing we knew, we were very stuck. Uh, we then tried to dig ourselves out, and mercifully, somebody came out to pull us out. That's the state of play at the moment. Let's go and have a quick look at this hyena. I it's the same fellow that was around here the other day. Karula's kill was in a tree not far from here, obviously on the bank, though. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry to disturb you, old fellow, but you know, we might need to get past. <laughs> it looks so comfortable there in the, sh <laughs> in the shade and the cool of the sand. I must say, it's getting hot already. It's going to be a pretty warm day, I think. And it seems as though the and predictions as about though the predictions the about are true. We're sorry, we lost James there for a second, but luckily some elephants to show you and slightly more in the open. 
Let's move forward and have a look. Oh, it seems as though after playing with the audio to get that brief glimpse behind the scenes glimpse of James getting unstuck, he might be having one or two issues as a result. Hello, little one. What have we got here? Tiny little male, young male, probably about five or six years old. Might even be reaching that cheeky stage where they come running up. And just before I left to go on leave, I had probably one of the most extraordinary elephant herd sightings I've ever had in my life. And some of the regular viewers will have been watching that morning. We had elephants tumbling down termite mounds. They were rolling around, young males rolling around on their backs, climbing on top of each other. One of them was doing a dance in front of me going down onto his knees and then back up again. It really was the most extraordinary sighting. But it was a much cooler day than today, and I think it was actually caused by the colder weather. They were rejoicing or reveling in the fact that it was no longer as hot as it was. Go forward a little bit. Really? Angel Aegis was wondering a little bit about the difference between our savanna elephants and a different type of elephant known as a forest elephant. Now, although they are the same species, they do have some significant differences, mostly their habitat. They are, as I said, they're the same species, so they look pretty much the same. And one thing I've noticed with forest elephants is that their tusks seem to be sort of shaped differently. They're more downward facing and a lot straighter and pointier than our savanna elephants. And then also, as far as I know, there's also a slight size difference with the forest elephants being fractionally smaller in, on average. That doesn't mean they aren't big forest elephants, but on average fractionally smaller than the savanna elephants, which makes sense because they're in more confined areas. Now, to the best of my knowledge, the only place where you would find forest elephants within South Africa is around the coastal region of Neisner. So the forested area around the garden route, the sort of southwestern corner of the country, we definitely don't see them in the Sabi Sands. And you only see the savanna elephants. I've never I've seen a forest elephant. elephant. I know that Brent has, and has in fact come far closer than he ever wished to, to a forest elephant. It was the one that ended, he ended up smacking him. I've never seen a forest elephant. It's on my list of animals to find. They are incredibly shy, far less relaxed than our savanna friends. They've had less human activity and less people moving around. Obviously, these elephants, even the oldest elephant in this particular herd will have grown up with people moving about on vehicles. So the Sabi Sands has been going for 40 years at least, the Kruger for far longer, which is one of the reasons, one of the special reasons why it makes for such an incredible place to watch natural animal behavior, because they are not concerned, or not terribly concerned, by the presence of vehicles. Very peaceful, a swishing tail. Well, there's something very special about the bonds between elephant herds. Anna was wondering whether or not the elephant is the only fem or the only animal where the females will act as midwives to other females in the herd. And I've, honestly, I have never heard of it happening with any other animal species in this particular area. So although lions, for example, might suckle the cubs of the, another female, a related a sister, for example, or a daughter, they don't, will not necessarily be present at the birth of that particular lion cub. 
Whereas with elephants, it is very much the birth of a baby and the birth of a youngster is very much a family affair. They stand together in a circle. They encircle the female in labor very often. And if she is a young female, they will spend a bit of time helping her and instructing her. Often young females, if it's their first baby, aren't completely sure how to go about it. I know there was that incredible story of the young mother that gave birth in the one of the big rivers in Kruger that was flowing at the time. And the baby got caught up in the current and the rest of the herd, the older females, the more experienced females were actually able to save the baby and teach the mom a little bit about how to care for the youngster. Very, very interesting behavior that they demonstrate. find a nice patch of shade for us as well in the middle of this herd. We don't want to get too close to them, but they are very comfortable with us, very, very relaxed. Now, I've had many instances where elephants have come exceptionally close to the vehicle, and because they're so intelligent, they often demonstrate curiosity. And Christopher, who's watching in Arizona, was wondering if an elephant ever approached me and attempted to touch me, for example, with its trunk. I can get the cheeky one at the back. Cute. Would I let it? And if not, why not? And the answer is no, I wouldn't let it. And there's a couple of reasons for that. It is a bad habit for them to learn. And they, if they learn that that is acceptable behavior, they instantly become a far more dangerous to a people. Imagine having a vehicle full of safari guests and an elephant that has now learned that it is a... Oh, we've got a snake. Let's go to James. It's right here. There's a Mozambican spitting cobra there, everybody. Look at him climbing along then. You can identify him. I don't know if you can see the stripes on his belly there. There he goes. It's a small one. Yeah. That is really awesome. It's obviously a little bit nervous of us and was lying there waiting to try and warm up in the sun. That's fantastic. That's really a nice sighting of a snake. We don't often get sightings like that. He'll try and seek out refuge there. Well spotted. Went into a hole. Went into a hole. I'm coming in go there. Oh, I'm going to go. Okay, okay. In go. Hmm? Go on the road. I'm sure, Vale. Oh, where are we? Oh, okay. All right, let's head back across to Jamie with some elephants and we'll catch up with you just now. Sorry about that, everyone. Just jumping out of the car to grab some litter before the elephants could figure out that it was there. It doesn't often happen that you find pieces of litter along the road, but every now and again, something falls out of a vehicle by mistake. So I just wanted to grab it quickly before the herd started to walk past it. <laughs> Sorry, playing chicken with Taxon at the moment. Give me one second, everyone, to just say hello. How's it going? Good, thanks. How's it, Tex? Hi, guys. Hi. I didn't pick up any tracks coming along this way. Yeah, because where that from the northern side of the power line, that yeah. goes into our oh, town here, but uh, no one goes also crossing this side. Okay. So I don't know. So they're somewhere in this block here. But uh, from last night, there might be, they might cross via Taylor main exit to the north. Oh, okay. Just saw that yeah, it could be somebody drove over them, that yeah. road. Yeah. All right, thank you. We'll yeah. keep looking. Right. Enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. Cheers, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the guests are very excited. There were exclamations of Safari Live. Yes, Safari Live, Safari Live. Yes, Safari Live. It's wonderful when that happens. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. There's nothing like learning a little bit about where your viewers viewership has actually reached. You'll probably end up saying hello to those guests at some point. Right, let me just re reorder my thoughts here and try to think about what I was saying earlier. By the way, Taxon's update was just that the Nkormas have crossed into Voyatella somewhere, but we cannot figure out where the tracks have come out. And the tracks that they've found are fairly old, and it's unlikely that they are still in the middle of this block. But we were in, we are in the right area. You never know, they might have just decided to spend the evening resting. I wanted to go back to Christopher's question about elephants touching me. And I said no. It's not that the temptation isn't there, but they learn incredibly bad habits from doing that. And if they go up to safari guests who maybe are terrified of them, <coughs> or for example don't know how to control their movements or how to move around elephants, and an elephant goes up to touch one of them and even for example somebody sneezes, in the back and gives that elephant a fright. You have an a situation that's gone from very peaceful to incredibly dangerous very quickly. Because all the elephant has to do is turn its head and knock a person accidentally and you have a very serious injury on your hands. So no, I would never let an elephant touch me. Um, I've always had the approach, I also personally don't let them touch my vehicle either. It's very, there are different approaches, but adopted by different people. I don't let them touch the vehicle. Um, I usually tap or just talk to them sternly. Sure. It was a very angry elephant. <laughs> a th we seem to have lots of elephants. I'm guessing at the moment there's about a hundred elephants on Juma. I can hear them all around us. It's a guess. It is an estimation. But I would not be at all surprised. We've seen bigger and bigger herds while this dry season has continued. And it's actually larger, would probably have been a better description. Mum and her baby. Try and reposition so we've got a nicer view. speak frequently. Is that okay for you there, Brian? We'll do the no, best right. we can get. Um, we speak regularly about Karula and the Unkuhumas and our different hyena families. But Noreen was wondering, why then do we not name elephants? And the answer is, there's a lot of tradition surrounding naming animals, but also the fact that elephants cover enormous distances and they're not really set to move about in territories. So although you can identify individuals relatively easily, and some of our more obvious elephants we have nicknamed over the last few years of Safari Live. So for example, Fang with her backwards facing tusk and the short trunked elephant, who's acquired different names via different presenters. They've all acquired little nicknames. However, it's not really that easy to name an elephant and then see it on a regular basis. For example, the short-trunked female, we didn't see for a good few months before she returned with a brand new calf. And particularly with this drought, we're going to see more individuals that we've never seen before. I know that yesterday I discussed the fact that we'd seen a male that was clearly from Kruger and from a part of Kruger where he didn't regularly see vehicles because he was exceptionally jumpy around the car didn't appreciate the noise or the presence of the vehicle, which is very unusual for most of the elephants in this area. That being said, it's different approaches. The reserve that I used to work on was a closed system. In other words, it was not four million hectares in size. And as a result, we knew each and every single elephant of the 74 odd elephants that there were. And they all had names like Queenie and Queenie was the matriarch of the one herd with her daughter Friendly. Friendly, I think, was my favorite name. And the reason behind that was Friendly was not Friendly. Friendly was very much an ironic name. 
She was not a friendly elephant at all. Uh, Dracula. Dracula was an amazing name for a female that took over from her mother. Her mother's name was Quetile, which means the grumpy one. And Dracula inherited her personality. Uh, Dracula with her short, stumpy, pointed tusks and somewhat Grum no, I wouldn't say grumpy, that's probably not fair, but she was definitely exceptionally protective of her herd. I had a very interesting encounter with Dracula on foot once. I came out of a clear out of a a thicket into onto the sort of the clearing around a river. And as I came out, I realized that I had baby elephants on my right and mommy elephant straight in front of me. So basically I'd stepped in between them. And we had a very interesting conversation, Dracula and I. It's the one and only time I've ever had to get my guests to really climb out of the way in a hurry, climbing up onto rocks. We were lucky we had a nice safe point to escape to. I don't think she was going to do anything serious. It's interesting that situation, how instinct and the way that you read animals plays a very large role because a lot of the Textbooks or the training would tell you that making yourself big and scary and waving your arms is the way to go to try and intimidate them. And in this particular case, I decided that it was the exact opposite of what I wanted to do. And she was sort of half charging down the road and all I did was drop into a crouch. Once I knew that my guests were safely out of harm's way, I just dropped down and made myself small. So she knew I was there, but I was basically trying to tell her that I wasn't a threat to her in any way. And for some reason, in that particular situation, it worked. Every, everything is circumstantial. Well, in terms of approaching an elephant and the safety of the elephants, it's really important to remember that no matter how well you think you know them, no matter how familiar you are with them, you never know what's been happening in their day. So we never go into a sighting where we're not constantly assessing and reading the body language of the animals that we're seeing. And one thing that we're always very careful to do, and it's something that our beard has asked about, is we're very careful in the way that we approach elephants. Now, very often it's really nice to let them, you never drive directly at them, it's really nice to let them approach you. But our beard, you were saying, is it good to approach them from the rear or is it dangerous to approach them from the rear? It's not ideal. So very often you'll find when you follow an elephant down the road, particularly males, they give you that constant, they look backwards over their shoulder. They don't like it. They can't see what you're doing. It doesn't, they don't appreciate it. It's much nicer to actually go around an elephant herd and let them walk towards you, let, make the choice theirs as to whether or not they decide to come up to you. I mean, in this case, We've got an elephant herd moving into an incredibly thick block. I could follow them. It's just not worth it because we're going to make a noise. They're not going to run. They're not going to be aggressive, but they're just it's just going to push them further and further. It's always important to remember that we're incredibly privileged to be in this sort of environment. And we're in their home. We're in their space. And you don't walk into somebody's home and constantly follow them around. It'd be very weird. So with elephants, it's important to have that natural level of respect. And they are the most dangerous because of their size, essentially. Now, I've actually seen very little in the way of fruits for the elephants to eat. I've said that I think that the population will increase. And Gainiac was wondering whether or not Juma's fruit supply could support the elephant population. Unfortunately, we've had hardly any fruits. I have never seen so little in the way of marulas. There have been hardly any this season, and that's just largely due to the drought. So no, the fruit, and we're actually re reaching the e end of the fruiting season. So unless they start raiding our kitchen, which of course they won't be doing, they will not really have access to fruit. What will essentially save animals within the Kruger, and particularly elephants, is trees. Because trees with their root system have access to nutrients that grass with their slightly um, less penetrative root system would not be able to access. So once all of the grass dries off, the animals will be largely reliant on the trees to keep them going. 
it will mean that the strongest only will survive it, but they will survive. Trees are the lifeblood of an area like this when a drought hits. Even those monkey oranges that are making it impossible for us to follow those elephants through. I'm going to leave this elephant herd and continue my search for the Nkuhuma's tracks. In the meantime, let's find out what Mr. Hendry's up to. Well, there's a flying version of the last scavenging bird we saw, a batelier. That's an adult male. We know that because he's got a thick black streak on the back of his wings. I just love watching those birds fly, especially as the heat starts to build. Oh. It's the most peaceful thing to do, to watch one of those birds just flying around and into the deep blue summer sky. In theory, autumn don't feel like autumn yet, temperature-wise, but you look at the bush around here, it is quite autumnal, but that's because we haven't had any rain. It's not autumnal because the day length has necessarily got that much shorter, that the leaves are starting to drop there trees, I nearly said, that the trees are starting to drop their leaves, is what I meant. Hello, Tom in Dallas. Um, you want to know about cyclones and the fact that we will be, basically, this part of your late summer is your hurricane season and you want to know if we have the same thing down here, the cyclones. We do get them around about this time of year sometimes, normally actually a bit earlier, but they come up through the Mozambican Channel. I don't think we get them as often as you get yours, and certainly I haven't heard of any big ones coming through this year. And so I think with the El Nino weather phenomenon, and that's what it is, it's a phenomenon. It's completely ununderstandable to someone like me, but there haven't been many cyclones off the eastern coast of Mozambique. Now, if they do come through there, we can absolutely get quite extreme flooding in this area. Flash flooding, huge dumps of rain, sort of five or six inches at a time, which for us is a, that constitutes a bit of a flood. I have yet to see something drinking from this newly wet dam. So I think we'll just continue straight along. Um, yeah, so Tom, we do get cyclones from time to time. I would say round about now would be the end of the cyclone season. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be common to have them now. You can see plenty of giraffe tracks and buffalo tracks that have clearly gone down to have a drink of the water there at some stage, but no longer. Anyway, uh, since you last saw us, we just had an update from that chap there who said that Karula had crossed into that reserve there. I think it's called Tiley Shur, but um, Chitwa Chitwa basically is, a, is the traversing group there, and so that was they were from Chitra Chitra. They saw her tracks going in there, no tracks of the cubs, which is good, I think. I Means she stashed them somewhere, and they are probably having a little bit of a snooze, a mid-morning snooze, which of course is very important for a young mammal. And indeed, for the parents' sake, a mid-morning snooze for the children is equally important. British Columbia, um, you say you're confused uh, because you understand why it's necessary to give Karula her space and to zone areas and that sort of thing, uh, but will the other safari vehicles avoid her? Um, well, they're not going to avoid her in the same way that we're not going to avoid her. They're not going to actively track the cubs, though, in the same way that we aren't. And certainly, I mean, I don't know what happens south of us. Uh, everybody's allowed to make their own rules. That's how it works when you have private land ownership. Uh, but everyone on Juma is not going to actively view her for more than 10 minutes at a time until such time as those cubs are competent tree climbers and a little bit more experienced. Now, you know, I mean, there are lots of different schools of thought around this, and I don't think that there's a hard and fast rule that you can make. I think you do have to make a hard and fast rule in an area where you have very different operating practices and you have very differing kind of... Um, uh, 
uh, what, what we say, we've got different, I mean, there's different training, there's different ways of operating, there are different kinds of operations. We're obviously filming, we are in a small vehicle, there are um, tourists with six to eight people on the back of the car, big cars, uh, and so you do have to make kind of a blanket rule, but is it necessary, like, like I was saying, if you were on your own, on your own piece of land, and you had a leopardess, and you knew where the cubs were, and you knew that you could sensitively get in there to film them, then I would have absolutely no problem with doing that. And I mean, John Varty has successfully done that at Londolosi a few times. He's watched cubs from when they were just a few inches long. And as long as that is, you know, it's one vehicle going in every so often, then I think it's fine. But obviously that's not possible in an area where there's so many vehicles and everybody wants to have a look. So then it just becomes a much more sensible thing to make a blanket rule and say, look, let's just leave her alone for now until those cubs are able to climb trees. Viam, can you believe it? We found another water buck. Are you overwhelmed with joy? There she is. I'm leaping for joy. And she's just sitting there under a Cumbritum calinum or variable bush willow. And I think it's so cool because these trees are, I've never noticed it before because I've probably never experienced a drought like this, but they are the most resilient things. The elephants are eating them all the time. Not the waterbuck, of course, I mean these variable bush willow trees that he was standing underneath. And they just form the most beautiful shapes, different bushy shapes, because of the elephants tearing them off. All the way around here. And I think if we don't have more rain fairly soon, uh, then we're really going to start to feel it. Anyway, so far, the animals seem to have got on with this drought absolutely fine. A couple of skinny looking elephants, one absolutely emaciated looking warthog, but I think she's sick. And we've seen her a few times. Otherwise, buffalo is starting to look a little bit ribby at the moment, uh, but they, until now, have looked absolutely fine. Viem and I saw two enormously fat, healthy-looking impala rams today, so they're okay. There's certainly been no die-off of young impala. Here are some impalas in front of us now. This is marvellous. Chris Rogue, long-time loyal viewer, obviously been keeping a bird list for some time. And Chris, you said that that tawny flanked crinia that we showed you was number 220. That is a seriously impressive bird list, especially as you've had to do it kind of remotely. And I know it's much harder to kind of see birds on film than it is to, well, film video than it is to see them live. So well done, Chris. 220 is impressive. Be quite interested to see your list, actually. So maybe you'd like to send it through to the final control. It's always a good idea to stop for Impala, simply because they are massively underrated because they tend to be so common. But they are exceptional to look at. They show exceptional behaviors. And I just really enjoy it. the most successful antelope out here. If there is water around, they will dominate completely. If there isn't water, they're not migrators. They can't migrate for some reason. Not sure why, but they're designed to sort of be, live a sedentary life around or close to water. Very nice question, monkey man. You want to know if we get Sunni here? Now, everybody, a Sunni is a very small antelope like a stienbok, and monkey man, oh, there's my little book. We don't get Sunni here, and I'll tell you why we don't. It's because they don't live in these sorts of areas. They like to live in forests, and I've seen them in northern KwaZulu-Natal, which is on the northeast coast of South Africa. Tiny little things, sort of the size. I wonder if this book's even got one. Yes, there it is. <clears throat> there is the Sunni over there, number four. It stands 35 centimeters at the shoulder. That means it's only a foot tall. It's a tiny little thing, and you'll only find it in forests. 
uh, in sand forest, which is a particularly characteristic kind of vegetation type in the north of or northeastern corners of coastal South Africa. That's where you find the Sunni. You will find them up north, I think, in Pafuri. Some of the forested areas up there might have some Sunni, um, but not common at all. And now just to give you an idea of the difference in size, there's a Steenbok. A Steenbok stands one and a half to two feet at the shoulder, whereas this little Sunni stands only one foot tall. So a very tiny little thing. Go. Cool. Very nice question. Thank you for that, monkey man. And um, yes, it is slightly larger than a Jack Russell. Just looking, yes, extreme north and northeast. Yeah, they like the forest. They like the cover that a forest provides. Hello, Sunita, you're back again. Thank you for your question about whether or not waterbuck or impala have any kind of prefer preference for vegetation. Uh, Sunita, I think that they probably have a lot more preference than we give them credit for. Certainly, uh, they will select for specific grazing grasses that have a higher protein content in them. Remember, protein is the limiting macronutrient that animals, or grazing animals have, so they will look for the highest protein content and the plants with the least amount of sort of structural material, which is very difficult to digest. And then, I think in a time like this, Impala specifically, the smaller they are, the more selective they're going to be. So something like a Sunni or a Stiernbok will be a very selective feeder, get up to the size of a waterbuck, not quite as selective because they're larger and so they have a slightly lower, what we call mass-specific metabolic rate. And that's not, no, not necessary for that you understand that term, but to say that I think even though we'd call, call something like a waterbuck almost a bulk grazer, which means it's not that selective, I think you'll find that they are pretty selective over which species they eat. And I suspect quite strongly as well that a lot of the animals out here will almost semi-self-medicate. They, they know somehow, physiologically, what nutrients they're lacking, They'll eat certain plants at certain times. They suck on bones, of course, and we know that they also will eat soil from time to time. Thank you, Sunita. Let us go up this road here. Have not tried it today. <laughs> Tando, you want to know if there are any springbok at Juma? No. Tando, springbok tend to not occur where impala occur, well not naturally, I know there are a lot of reserves that have em employed both for entertainment purposes, but springbok are largely a high filled and desert species. So they live in areas where this is not a high rainfall area by any stretch of the imagination. They live in even lower rainfall areas, so what, up onto the high filled and on the fringes of the Kalahari and then into the Kalahari is where you can find springbok. And down in the Karoo, of course, which we know has got very little rain indeed. Thank you, Tando. Nice question. A springbok, everybody, of course, is South Africa's national animal. National mammal. There's some diker there. I think it's a little one, hey? Yeah? yeah it's a baby and an adult. It's a baby and an adult there. A Sunni sized diker and an adult sized diker standing upon a termite mound. Look, it's tiny. You can just see the little one moving through the shadows there. Very vulnerable, obviously. Work a ruler around here. That would make a very pleasant breakfast snack. Mm -hmm. You can just see the little bit of flickering about there. Right, Jamie has yet again managed to find something large and interesting. Let's go across to her. I will attempt to do the same on this road. There's a, a herd of four very shiny zebra in this morning light. Brian and I were just commenting about how incredibly bright this morning feels. And I've spoken about this before, but I've never experienced glare 
in the same way as I have this summer. And I don't know if it's because there's less vegetation. Look at that, that's awesome. <laughs> Four zebra backs in a row. And I think what we've got here is another bachelor herd, from what I can see. Doesn't look like a breeding herd of zebra, although I have been keeping an eye out for that brand new fall. That's awesome. Zebra are so picturesque, no matter what they do, even when they're presenting the, you with a view of their rear ends. But yes, I have been searching for that young zebra. No sign of him. There seem to be lots of zebra around at the moment. See the way the sun is glinting off their backs. I noticed that in the Kruger as well, driving through a clearing, and the way it was so easy to spot animals, just because of the amount of light that, that was bouncing off them. I really think it's because there's not as much vegetation as there usually is at this time of year to absorb the light. Is that mud on his leg or an injury? I think just mud. Sometimes when they have a bite or a scratch or something, they'll go and deliberately wallow in mud to cool, A, to cool it down, which is always, whenever you get an infection or an injury, one of the first symptoms is heat around the area. So for them, going and wrapping it in mud is a way of relieving the pain a little bit and cooling it down. But I think in that case, it's just, just mud, just a muddy zebra. I'd stopped here in the hope that they were actually going to come walking towards us. But this morning they seemed to be dawdling. And in sightings like this, you can have a really good look at how different each individual's stripes are. Now I thought I saw wildebeest at the back. I, I can't see them anymore, so I might have been imagining it. But speaking about different species of different animals that you could see in this area, Siberia Zumi was wondering about where one could spot a black wildebeest. So a different species to the blue wildebeest that we get in this area with twisty horns. And Siberia Zumi, you are in essence correct. It's, it's not necessarily a more arid area. It's a higher altitude and a more grassland environment. So black wildebeest are pretty much isolated in South Africa to a province known as the Free State, which sits right in the center of the country and is the start after the Drakensberg Mountains. The rest of the country goes up into a very, very high plateau, which culminates in places like Johannesburg, which are some of the highest cities in the world. But you'll find black wildebeest in large open plains of the Free State and the grasslands, maybe a little bit into the Eastern Cape and the Northern KwaZulu-Natal areas. Very different looking animal, very interesting looking animal. Uh, at some point I might show you a picture, but in the meantime, James has found another grazing animal for you. This is an absolutely epic sighting, everybody. We're sitting here not more than maybe six or seven feet from this buffalo bull. He's looked up and had a bit of a smell at us, but he's very comfortable. He's a magnificent fellow, but what I wanted to show you was the fact that his hips are now starting to show a little. And I don't think two weeks ago they were at all in any of the buffalo. He's not a particularly old fellow. He's in pretty good nick otherwise. But he is massive. I mean, you just, you, I mean, the, he stands probably, what, about mm, as tall as we are, Liam, maybe about five foot eight at the shoulder, and will weigh up to 800 kilograms, and that is 1,800 pounds. So he's a massive, massive beast. And normally they don't let us get this close. They normally walk off. And the wind is even blowing towards him. He can smell us. I'm just going to go a little bit back. Hello, Dory in South Carolina. <laughs> this is so cool. 
story. You want to know what the smallest antelope in the world is? I think you'll find it's a blue dacre, if I'm not mistaken. Liam, do you have any further insight on that? No. The Sunni would come very close, but I think a blue dacre is probably slightly smaller, found in the forests of Central Africa. I'll check that up for you, Dory. But let's just enjoy this buffalo. I mean, I can't believe how confiding he's being. not everyone's most sort of favorite animal in the world but to see them eating like this is amazing what you what, what you should look out for if you can see his mouth again is the way his tongue wraps around the grass plants and he's also browsing every time he goes past a decent uh, sort of greenish leaf there look 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 he's found some leaves to eat and that only happens when buffalo are under nutritional stress. It's only the, that's the only time that they will browse leaves as opposed to grasses. Just watch how he's eating there. And that will tell you, of course, that buffalo live on their own when they're old and can't keep up with the herd anymore. I am less and less subscribing to that school of thought. This is buffalo, it looks to me like he's in his prime. I don't think there's any reason that he shouldn't be mating. He's got big horns, he's big and heavy, and I think what happens is that actually they just find the strain of keeping up with a herd a bit heavy. So they'll join with the herd for a while, and then when they lose condition, and they will lose condition because they have to fight for mating opportunities, I think they'll probably drop off into these bachelor herds and lurk around for a while and then rejoin a herd when it comes through an area. And especially when it gets really dry. I mean, at one stage, we had about 30 buffalo bulls lurking around the Juma Dam pan, and that was at the height of the dry season, at least the dry drought. Oh, that's interesting. Sherry in Colorado, that's quite interesting. Um, <laughs> You want to know, obviously a ruminant is an animal that brings its food up into its mouth, rechews it, and then swallows again. And you want to know if that is an involuntary or voluntary reaction. I would think that it's largely involuntary, Sherry. I think, a bit like breathing, where you will breathe naturally without thinking about it. And, but if you want to take a deep breath, <gasps> you can take a deep breath. And I suspect it's quite similar to that, where it's not entirely involuntary. In other words, if they wanted to stop and move on and not keep re-chewing, they probably could. But I suspect that it's an involuntary reaction. And that, I mean, to, to have a peristalsic, reverse peristalsic um, movement, voluntary movement, I think would be very difficult for the, for the brain to, to handle. Now, what that means is, Peristalsis is that movement of your esophagus and your, um, your digestive tract where the muscles contract like and move the, your food down the tubes. And the reverse happens when a buffalo vomits, and same when you vomit uh, into its mouth. And that's a completely involuntary thing. So, yeah, I don't know, maybe they suck some air in there and help it up a bit, I don't know. It's an interesting question. But I do know that once they fall, that's it. They can't keep eating. They must stop first, then reach you, and then carry on eating. Ah. This is why this is such a wonderful, wonderful job. Um, Aruz and many, many viewers saying the royal antelope of West Africa is the smallest antelope in the world. Thank you very much for that. Three to five kilograms. That's minute. That is in pounds. Well, it's less than 10 pounds. 
absolutely astonishing. Three to three and a half kilograms. Is that really, not a good snack for a leopard? No, it's not even a good snack for a leopard, for him, um, unless the leopard was particularly small, mm. the junior leopard. Mm. Royal Antelope, thank you very much for that. A ruse. Jamie has got a very rapidly moving reptile. Let's go and see what it is. Um, and here you can see something that we encountered a speaks hinge tortoise. And sitting right in the middle of the road. He got a bit of a fright as we came around the corner and he's decided to dash off at high speed, as James suggested. And you're seeing more and more tortoises active even without the rain. I think because they're being forced to try and stock up before winter occurs. And since it has, since there's a couple of green shoots now for them to feed on, they'll be coming out more regularly. Doing the usual tortoise thing of trying to disappear into a clump of vegetation. The most ungainly way. They are such interesting animals. And since we are here, and since our tortoise has disappeared a little bit, we can have a look at the tracks that he's actually left behind in the road. It's one of those fun things to do, especially when you've seen an animal, so you know exactly what made the track, to go there and look at what they leave in the road. You can actually see there's two tracks, almost like a little tank has moved through. Then there's that little scuffed patch where he saw us and then turned around and then the tracks with the sweeping edges leading off to where he walked off the road. And now, forever after, if you see a tortoise track, if I point out a tortoise track, I'm gonna make you tell me the direction that it's walking in as well. Because now you know where he's just come from and where he's gone, and what the tracks look like, with a little bit of a sweep of the sand as he went along. So next time I'm gonna see a tortoise track, I'm gonna ask you both what it was and which direction he was going in is for a little something different. I'm sure you will all rise to the occasion. Here we go, little guy. I think I'm going to just stop ever so briefly and see how camouflaged he is with that coloring much less brightly colored than the more commonly spotted leopard tortoise. Near as we see you. Trying to sneak further undercover. All right, buddy, we will leave you be. And we will carry on in our search for the last few moments of the sunrise safari. Now, we've chatted a lot this morning about the different species that you can see in this particular area while we drive along. And we have a question about whether or, or which other dog species, wild dogs or fox-like species we might see, aside from the wild dogs. So Virtual Tourist was asking about that and watching all the way in Dallas. Now, in terms of true canids that occur in this particular area, we have an animal that fills almost exactly the same niche as would do in Europe and America. We have two species, the side-striped and the black-backed jackal. Now, what we've noticed is over the last year or so, there's been a severe drop in the population of jackals in this particular area. Apparently, that is just naturally what jackal populations do. They grow exponentially and then all of a sudden drop off very quickly. It might be a disease that catches them. It might be competition for space. But they go through sort of seven-year cycles of population peaks and then troughs. And at the moment, we have a bit of a trough. So we hardly ever see jackal. We do see them occasionally. Side-striped more commonly than black-backed jackal. So that is the only other true canid species within the Sabi Sands itself within the greater Kruger area for the most part. Within South Africa, there is one other animal that is actually the closest, that is the only true fox, and that is the Cape Fox. 
is also a little animal known as a bat-eared fox. Fascinating little termite eater that lives in groups with adorably large bat-like ears. And I actually think what I'm going to do is stop and show you a photo of it, but I'm going to do that in the shade because Brian and I are starting to cook. Here we go. How's that, Brian? You, no, you're not in the shade at all. Oh, that was made with the best intentions. There you go. No, you're still in the sun. Yeah, it's all right though. It's all right. Brian says it's okay. He will, he'll suffer through the heat. Let's find a bat-eared fox for you quickly. Not something that you will see in this area. They're much more sort of arid-based. How do you spell bat? There we go. I did just ask how to spell bat. There you go. That is a bat-eared fox. Tiny, tiny little animal. About 30 centimeters, maybe, what does that equate to? About 15 odd, 13 odd inches at the shoulder. Adorable little animal with these huge bat-like ears. Hence the name bat-eared fox and just ever so slightly out of our range. So where I went in the greater Kruger area, we had a chance to possibly see them. <coughs> so that colored part, obviously the shaded part is their range. And we are sitting just to the south in this corner here, just above that dot that is Johannesburg. So that is the Batyard Fox. Then we have the, the wild dog, which you guys are familiar with. I'm not going to show you a picture of that. This is a Cape Fox the only true fox that we have. Also a very tiny animal and more isolated to the more arid areas of the country. I've seen a couple of them. They're awesome little animals. Yep. Again, around the sort of the Kalahari regions, more desert based, where they can be outside of the competition with other species. And then our jackals, those are the ones that you could see here. You can see very dog-like in terms of shape. That's a side-striped. And we see them really very regularly, well, not fairly regularly, but we see them more regularly than we see the black-backed jackal. And there you go. That is pretty much the summary of the canids. So the relate, related to dogs, animals that we see around here. I'm going to carry on in the meantime. James has found some more elephants for you, apparently with some very muddy ears. I think this is quite possibly one of the same herd that you saw earlier, everyone. Um, we're quite close to where Jamie first saw the elephants, but there are a whole lot along this road, many of them sort of heading into the thick bush to spend the rest of the day in the shade where they will rest up probably nibbling on the odd bit of bush and the rest of the time snoozing. It's so peaceful to watch elephants having a bit of a graze. And this is a young one, of course. I mean, you can't probably not see that because he's full frame for you, but probably only a 10-year-old elephant. So there'll be lots around here. And obviously they don't feel there's any threat. And so they've split up to go and look for things to eat. There he goes. Let me just sneak forward and see if there aren't one or two more. Hello, Bethany. You want to know if elephants get arthritis? Um, Bethany, I don't know for sure. I think that you will find that any animal out here, if it lives long enough, will get an element of sort of arthritis where the bones develop funny nodules and the joints become difficult to move. Remember, though, very few animals out here live beyond breeding age. Very few animals live to a point where they actually get to old age, as it were. Elephants are one, of course. They will live to about 60 years old, and a female won't be giving birth at 60 years old. So I think it's possible they get arthritis. I think also, though, many of the diseases that affect human beings and, indeed, domestic dogs are born of the fact that we don't eat what we evolved to eat. And so if you look at something like a, uh, a domestic cat or a domestic dog, first of all, 
it lives longer than it would in the wild. And secondly, of course, it doesn't eat a, a diet of sort of organic natural food that it would living out here. And I, I think that that really makes a profound difference to why it is that we as human beings get these diseases of old age and also the diseases um, that, and why our pets do and why animals out here, I don't think, get nearly the same number of arthritis, cancers, neurological disorders and all of those sorts of things that seem to afflict us and our urban lifestyles. Possibly also the stress, of course. How stressful can it be standing under a marula tree every day? So, nice question there. We get lots of comparisons about human diseases and human... <laughs> there are a whole suite of other elephants there while I yak away here. And they're feeding through what we call a silver cluster leaf orchard. I think it's a beautiful set of trees here. It's one of my favorite little parts of the reserve. But I think you'll find much of the comparison between human disease and animal disease and why it is that animals are, do not suffer from the same things that we do. Diabetes, uh, cancers, as I said, neurological disorders, arthritis. One of those things that uh, pharmaceutical companies make millions and millions of dollars off every year and that human beings suffer from in ever-increasing numbers, I think you'll find it's got a lot to do with our lifestyle, far more than with anything else. Right, on we go. Seem to be obviously a bit of an elephant hotspot here at the moment. I mean, a couple of days we didn't have an elephant you couldn't find one for love nor money. But all over here there are elephants. Right, that's it from us, everybody. Uh, thank you, Vian, for your efforts today. Well done, yes. Thank you to Jamie, of course, for holding the fort while we found absolutely nothing for the first two hours of the drive. And a big thank you to Louise and Kirsten, the final control. We're going to hand you over to Jamie and Brian for the last few moments and just to say a final farewell to Scott and Nikki, who are going to be leaving us today after drive. Bye-bye to the two of them, and we'll see them again with any luck. towards camp. I think we're all feeling a little bit downhearted today. Be a farewell to Scott and Nikki. We'll be saying goodbye to them when we get back. Yesterday's fireside chat, I think we all claimed that the tears were caused by the smoke inhalation, which I'm not going to exaggerate, did, did play a slight role in the amount of tearfulness that occurred, but there were some genuine tears there as well. It will be very, very sorely missed, but we wish them all the best. In the meantime, though, we've actually had a wonderful morning. I'm going to try and light the atmosphere by teasing poor James about being entrapped in the Mulwati. Well, there we go. Seems as though stopping for those tortoise tracks made Simon very happy. Simon, it's a pleasure. Apparently, Simon spent a considerable amount of time in the Kruger photographing tracks and documenting them for a research guide that he was putting together, but that he hadn't encountered tortoise tracks and thus was rather chuffed. Well, Simon, if there's any other tracks that you would like us to keep an eye out for, you're more than welcome to let us know. And then just keep tuning in. We'll keep an eye out for them for you. And then we can stop and you can screenshot them whenever we do find them. Tortoises and terrapins was one of the things that we had spent a little bit of time learning the difference between. Tortoise and terrapin, the difference in their tracks is not something easy, terribly easy to determine. 
Lots and lots of elephants around. It seems I've seen tracks all over the show and they're all wandering into Duma. So this afternoon's prospect could well be that we have an elephant drive, but also the possibility that the Nkurumas make an appearance. They're probably somewhere on this property. We've just been struggling to figure out exactly where they went. Maybe they might decide to go across to Galago Pan or keep your eye on the Jube Dam camera because you never know if they might decide to go and drink there. Exciting prospects all around for this afternoon. As always, a big thank you to Brian who does such a fantastic job on camera. Extraordinary images that you get to witness every single day. And a big thank you as well to Louise and Kirsty and Final as well as to Eugene for helping out with all of the technical things. And most importantly, thank you to all of the viewers for joining us, as always, for your wonderful questions, your marvellous comments, and generally your thoroughly entertaining comment. Have a wonderful day wherever you are in the world, and we'll catch you this afternoon. Cheers, everybody. Whoops.